Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new edition of the Jim Cornette Experience, where today we ask the musical question, who will buy this wrestling promotion? Price so high, it's way in the sky. Nick Khan says it'll take 90 days, but oh, what will they do if more and more people sue? And there's no sucker who will buy. And to join me in this melodious trip through the week's wrestling activities, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he's the Carl Quintanilla of wrestling podcasts, the oh. great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. With all due respect, I like that show. I watch that show. Carl Quintanilla does a good job, but... I'd prefer to be the David Faber of the show. Well, I couldn't And you remember. could be the Morgan Brennan. I couldn't remember it. Well, thank you. Hello there. I'm watching Hi. my girlish figure. I couldn't remember fucking Farber's name. And Faber. I was so proud of myself that I could pronounce Quintanilla that I went with him. Yeah, you blow them all out of the water anyway. You you know, and, and let's face it, uh, you've got a wider listenership. But... Well, that part... Uh, so today we're going we're to talk about what happened this past week in AEW and WWE on television and probably the more important news of, of old Farber, my man Farber. Faber. There, Farber may have, Faber. have exposed Nick Khan's business right in front of God and everybody on the CNBC machine. We're going to talk about that. We talk about who's going to end up with this white elephant as it's looking more and more imminent um and we're gonna we're gonna talk to, to some people out there in the cult of cornet recognize them for various things but i gotta ask you right off the bat here and we didn't talk about this before we went on the air because i want your your unvarnished opinion as mama cornet used to say your unvarnished opinion or your first blush reaction to this is <sighs> what is the fucking deal with Groundhog Day, how did this become a thing? Why is this is this celebrated around the world? Does everybody know now what I'm talking about? When I, do they think it's just a movie? If over in the UK or Germany or Australia, New Zealand, the place that places that our voices go out to, maybe they've seen the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray and they think it's something that the wacky Americans made up for a movie. They don't know that it's legitimately a thing. Or is this worldwide? If you if you go over to Bolivia and you say, well, Groundhog Day, do they instantly know what the fuck's going on? Well, I can't speak to uh, Bolivia, but I did see something on the news this week, which I found surprising, which was Groundhog Day in the Ukraine. Well, now, the, the, well, have we imported that to the, it's like it now the United States and Ukraine are the only places in the world it has Groundhog Day, or is this, is it a spreading phenomenon? Where do groundhogs live? In the goddamn ground. But not throughout the whole world. I mean, I'm sure there are parts of the world that can't be groundhogs. What do you think? They live in trees? And then they'd be tree hogs. Can they live in hot climates? I've had Can they live near the equator? You know what? I haven't investigated. I when I when I've bought real estate in my life, I haven't checked to see whether or not it's groundhog friendly. I know I got, I've had plenty of them. But the the <laughs> here's the thing. It it just have in you case pulled one out that, of the ground? It was, uh, you know what? You can try. Have They'll you? fight you on it, but then you, you then you you can try to hose them and run them. And what? But point being, there is for the international listeners now. I'll briefly summarize that somehow it has gotten to be a thing in the United States of America that there is a town in Pennsylvania named Punxsutawney, and in the town of Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. Lives a groundhog named Phil. I swear to God, if you're hearing this story for the first time, I'm not making this up. Lives a groundhog named Phil. People have heard this, this is, before. This is, but I don't know if people in goddamn Australia have any outback somewhere. They think we're we're insane. And in Pugsatawney lives a groundhog named Phil. And apparently, because this has been going on for years and years and years, and I don't know the lifespan of a groundhog, but I bet you. If I had to put my money on it, there's been a succession of fills. But the story has now become that if Punxsutawney Phil, the groundhog, 
emerges from his hole on the Groundhog Day, which is, I don't know if it's the same date every year and it's like a Wednesday or a Thursday one year or whatever, or if it's the first Tuesday or whatever, but it was just this last week, the first part of February. If he comes out of his gimmick and he sees his shadow, he will turn around and he will go back in his fucking den there where he's been hibernating. And that means we get six more weeks of winter. But apparently, although I don't know if this ever happens, because usually the motherfucker turns, he sees thousands of people gathered around. He sees these people. The, the, have you seen the goddamn grandmaster of the Groundhog Day Parade? He dresses up in a goddamn top hat and tails and looks like he stepped off the top of a groundhog wedding cake and he's there as the master of ceremonies <laughs> and there's goddamn television lights and cameras and media from all over the fucking country put and here comes this poor little goddamn furry rodent out of his hole to see this it looks like the goddamn invasion of normandy coming at him of course he's gonna turn around and shit himself and go back to his hole and what do you think Every year we get six more weeks of winter because it's the first of February. So what else would we have but six <laughs> more weeks of winter? Because that's how long winter's supposed to last is another six fucking weeks. It's not six additional weeks on top of the traditional end of winter? No, it's six. It's, apparently, if this motherfucker ever comes out and does a goddamn <laughs> two-step and, and uh, does a Michigan J Frog routine... Yeah, hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my right. And and then walks off to go have groundhog brunch with all of the celebrants. Then apparently it just instantly <laughs> becomes 70 degrees from that point forward. Spring has sprung. The groundhog has sprung. sprung. The, the groundhog has spoken. So what I want to know is how did we, as a fucking society, make a meteorologist or a weather prognosticator out of a fucking rodent that lives in the ground. What do you think's happening in the ground? All right. it is, we it learned is, our lesson. I'm not going to go for it. Hey, this guy's a sucker. Let's push it. Let's see if he does it. <laughs> yeah. And it, well, and that's another thing is, is there any more in there? Is it just, is it, is it really Phil that comes out the one that really knows what's going on and can tell and forecast the weather or is it his fucking brother-in-law Ben? I forget. And this is a sad question. I probably should know the answer. Does Phil wear a bow tie? <laughs> does the groundhog like, have something that distinguishes it? From other they, groundhogs. They picked this poor, the, the fucking guy in the top hat and the tails. I don't know. Whatever, whatever his name is. Grandmaster Groundhog. He apparently grabs this poor little fucking scared animal by the scruff of his neck and picks him up and holds him. I've seen the pictures of him holding up poor Phil to public ridicule and, and Phil's fucking shaking like a dog shitting peach seeds. Doesn't want to be anywhere around this goddamn pervert. Who knows what the fucking guy, the Grandmaster Groundhog, does with Phil after he fucking snatches him out of his hole? How do you rise up in those ranks? To be the Grandmaster To be the Grandmaster. Groundhog? Like, do you have to start as, like, one of the flunkies? Do you have to carry the bag of the... <laughs> the assistant grandmaster just hoping yeah. you can get near the grandmaster you have to carry the grand and <laughs> clean out the groundhog litter box <sighs> anyway if anybody out there can shed any light or perhaps even a shadow on uh, how the fuck that they all lost their minds up there in Punxsutawney now I know it's, it's, it's not like it's not a big city up there it's rural there, you know, it's probably not too far from the Poconos up there and down the road from Schuylkillhaven. Uh, they got some strange names for the towns up in Pennsylvania these days, but I would like to know how this became a thing and how this spread and how this happened. And is it mass hysteria? Are these people just bereft of any other thing to do in their lives up there? And, but the, the people travel and the media covers it and everybody on everybody's local news across this country. The prognostications of a groundhog take precedence over the weather report. Are there lots of local shops like with groundhog merchandise like year round? Do people go there any other time of the year? Like this is where the groundhog may appear next yeah, well, year. 
<laughs> what else are you going to buy in Punxsutawney? I don't know. They've got groundhog magnets, groundhog shot glasses, piggy banks shaped like groundhogs. You could take your picture next to a sign that says the groundhog was here with like an arrow pointing down. Yes. <laughs> or you or you can have a fucking bloody furrows in your fucking leg when is the groundhog <laughs> was here because them fucking things don't like to be fucked with. And, and speaking of weather-related news, though, also, did, and I know you've heard about this because we commented on it, but apparently now, for those of you around the, the world, again, interested in the freakish weather that the United States is having. By the way, it's 15 degrees this morning here in Louisville, Kentucky, oh, and I've warm. got ice in the in the front yard, ice patches that have been there for five days that have not melted yet, but in three more days, it's going to be 60 degrees and rain another inch or two, just so you know. But that's nowhere near what's going on in New Hampshire. There, the, what is it? Mount Mount Washington. Mount Washington. Yeah. Mount Washington, New Hampshire, is apparently the elevation is six thousand some feet, and the wind chill there over the past what day or or more now has been more than a hundred degrees below zero because the winds are blowing at. I guess epic levels, and it's so high up in the air, and it's so cold to begin with. It was like between 103 and 110. That's the record for the low, the coldest wind chill ever recorded in the. Well, at least I guess the, the they said the United States. Would that include Alaska? We just barely remember we have that is indeed part of the united states yes but yeah but well you know it it, was it the contiguous united states i mean could have been different in alaska or hawaii what's the lowest wind chill in the history of hawaii well we don't know but anyway so it's over 100 degrees below zero in mount washington new hampshire on top of the mountain jim i've sent you a link because i saw an article about this in the new york post because apparently it was colder on top of Mount Washington yesterday, I have some video. You can see what it looked like. I'm seeing this. I've 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 clicked on the email you've sent, but it, it was colder than colder than Mars. It was actually what? warmer on the surface of Mars yesterday than it was at the top of Mount Washington in New The Hampshire. planet, the planet Mars. Now it's not. It's not one of those trick questions like there's a place called Hell, Michigan. So we say, well, it's hotter <laughs> no, than no, Hell. No, 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 right? no. no, this is actually the, the little planet, red planet Mars. Yes, that's right. And I'm going to click on this. What it's a Twitter, a Twitter piece, an official here. Twitter video from the National Weather Service in Cleveland. Official. Of course, my I have Spectrum Internet, so my Twitter is still loading. Ah, National Weather Service Cleveland. This is extreme weather, right? What? Holy Jesus, fucking Christ! Wind chill 101 below zero. Temperature, actual temperature, 42 degrees below zero. And the wind gusts are 127 miles an hour. And there's a, a an unmanned camera, obviously, that's, that's showing. Apparently, that's a, a building of some kind or a weather station of some kind normally. And it's been completely almost submerged in a snowbank. Yeah, they're waiting for the Empire to hit it. Looks like it's Jesus. on Hoth. Jesus. And, and it's just, it's encased in not even a snowbank, but a snowbank with an ice shell. It look <laughs> hey, Jim, for the record, here's what it says in the New York Post. Meanwhile, on Mars, temperatures on the surface this week reached a balmy high of 16 degrees with a low of minus 105, according to NASA. The space agency said temperatures on the red planet can fluctuate between minus 225 and minus 70 degrees. Good Lord. So they're having a heat wave there while this is happening in New Hampshire. A tropical heat wave. Hey, the All way, right. hey, the way, um, when is a new Pope, the smoke comes out of the Vatican or the certain color smoke. smoke. Does this say that's, anything? That's, a, that's only if they make Snoop Dogg the next Pope. Does this say anything that's happening in New Hampshire about Triple H's role in the future of WWE. <laughs> <laughs> Hell has frozen over, ladies and gentlemen, and it's colder on in New Hampshire than it is on Mars. Um, how do we uh, how do we get in or out of that? It's all right, show. this is your show. Hey, a couple of happy birthdays. First of all, this past week, it because today it was, so it was two days ago. The second happy birthday to Dennis Condry. 
Hey, Bye. happy birthday. Um, and uh we want to send our happy birthday wishes out to him and his lovely well, I don't know what his lovely wife Teresa's birthday is, but it's not hers, but with but just them as a couple. We hope they had a wonderful day. I gotta call him later on. And secondly, today as we are recording right here, right now, as we speak, it is the birthday of Kippelman. From the Arcadian Vanguard Minion staff. And well, we want, how, no. how would, old is he now? I, first of all, I wouldn't put it that way. Lou Kippelman, one of the esteemed members of the staff here at Arcadian Vanguard, and I will never reveal uh, someone else's age. That's an HR violation. Well, he looks so fucking old. I was hoping you'd tell me that, you know, he's really younger than he looks. He doesn't look old at all. Why would you say that? Well, it, why do you it have just, to pick on someone on their birthday? What are you, Vince McMahon? He seems to make to him be, lose in his hometown. He seems to be somewhat decomposing in front Stop. of our eyes, and I just thought that I would. Happy birthday, Lou! Bring that up, and also uh, a get well to our friend in Philadelphia, Professor Ouch. He sent me a package in the mail, and and note I didn't know he'd been having health issues here for the past. A little while, and I hope he's feeling better. Nips up, uh, but I last saw him at the uh, at the Philly Comic Con that I did. What that was either twenty eighteen or twenty was it twenty nineteen? I can't remember. Years are blurring since I've been off the road. And he's the, he's the one who saved us on the have a beef with Jim Cornette when the other cheesesteak place fell through. But he sent a package in the mail to me. A couple of things. One was a picture. I don't know if he took this. I think he was in the building at night. He may very well have taken it, but it was a picture from Philadelphia from the Civic Center. Do you remember the story I've told the night before I had to wrestle Heyman in the tuxedo match at the Bash pay-per-view in Baltimore? I fucking blew my knee jumping out of the ring to get away from a flying table thrown by Freebird Terry Gordy. Right, And I had to work that match with the fucking one leg swollen up and blah, 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 and have it drained and all that shit. Well, he sent an actual picture of Gordy throwing the table. And I'd forgotten that he didn't, like, grab a table and fold it up. There was no table under the ring back then. He didn't just pull out a folded up table and slide it over the top rope. He grabbed the eight-foot lunchroom table that was being used for the timekeeper and the ring announcer and the commissioner there in Pennsylvania and just grabbed it by both sides and picked it upside down over his head, legs and everything and fucking overhead chucked it over the top rope into the fucking ring. I'm standing on the apron because I'd gotten out of the way of him on the floor when he was going on his tirade. And so and fucking... When he chucked it, it all it's almost clears the top rope, and you see it balancing right there because the part of it caught the top rope and it was starting to flip up in my direction with those fucking legs, right? And so I've got the racket over the side of left side of my face trying to block that, and I'm just at the buckles and at the ring post, so I got no more apron, and I'm looking to jump off when the picture is taken. And moments later, it did not end well for me as when I landed, my foot was on the edge of those fucking mats that TBS had put around the ring that everybody was blowing their ankles on. Didn't cushion the fucking concrete. They were cheap fucking high school mats, but they just slid around and made you blow your fucking legs. And boom, and my knee goes sideways even though I'm wearing my brace, and there we go. But at the same time, I evaded a... Uh, fucking smashed in face or being impaled through the ears for, by the table legs, courtesy of Bam Bam. He was quite a sight when he was doing with one of his things at ringside. You believed it. You got out of the way. Anyway, and also, and you would love this, Brian, uh, Professor Ouch, because, of course, he does deal in the he the bazaar the bazaar or the bazaar bazaar is it was the name of his store that he had and he does deal in various odd items and he sent me a book from about 30 years ago just self published book on human circus oddities they we used to call them freaks in the old days before that became politically incorrect 
but it's not a book like knocking them or whatever. It's by a guy who worked in the circus for years, years, was friends with Ollie and tells stories about him. And it, I op- I've only had time to just flip through it quickly. I just got it yesterday. But it is dedicated. Have you ever heard the name of a guy named C.M. Christ? Uh, no, I don't think so. C.M. Christ, it's dedicated to C.M. Christ, who did work in and for the circus. He was a promotions man and an advance man and, and for the carnivals and et cetera. But he... And I don't remember now, and I'm hopefully when I say this, again, some of our listeners, they're ingenious. Somebody's going to remember this guy from the Florida area specifically because he was promoting live events for WCW in like the after TBS bought the company when I was still there and in the in the booking office or on a creative team, as they would say. Uh, and for a little while in the early nineties, was in that range, he w- I'm trying to think that some way or another, he had gotten involved in wrestling in the days of the Florida office. And it makes sense because after Ronnie West got out of wrestling, he went work for the circus and so did Bill Dundee. And then Randy Hales did too. And they would travel and do the advanced publicity work and things, promoting wrestling, promoting circus, promoting an event, right? It's, natural hand and glove but this guy was a heck of a local promoter uh for a variety of things cm christ and i remember him coming on board and then i you know i was gone and blah 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 and i think he i believe he died before his time i don't think i'm not saying he was run over by a fucking bread truck or something i think he had an illness or some kind of disease or whatever but But he was one of those characters that you meet in the wrestling business. And this book, completely unrelated, and a guy I haven't thought of in 30 years, and haven't seen, obviously, in 30 years, and it's dedicated to him. Very odd coinkadinks. Do you like the do you like the human oddities, Brian, the circus performers of the old days? Yeah, I got a porn book over here dedicated to Gary Juster. Oh, come on! What in the world? As a matter of fact, it might have been Gary Jester that might have gotten to see him, Chris. <laughs> anyway, and then I got something else. That, so you're just going to stay completely off the world's fattest man, the bearded lady, yeah. the three, the the side, the three headed calf. Let me know when you get the Johnny Eck, and then you can pull me into the conversation. Oh come on! I mean, it used to be a big deal. When you know, first thing I wanted to do when I went to the state fair was go to the sideshow and see all the. The uh, are we allowed to say in in that context? They called them circus freaks back then. But well, now I think you can because of the movie. The movie kind of legitimizes you know yeah. the idea of talking about the genre of yeah the freaks. They called themselves freaks. They they kind of accepted that was the whole thing. We accept you, one of us. Yeah, but I'll tell you what though. One year, boy, well, I can't remember. I couldn't have been very old because I think it may have been the first time I saw the world's fattest man. And of course, every different show had traveling had a world's fattest man. So, you know, let the buyer beware, right? Uh, Lee caveat empty or whatever the case. But one year I saw what I had to believe. I was fully convinced there was no arguing this point. This was the fattest man in the world. He was fucking ginormous. He was immense. It's big. I mean, I've been around some big people now. And I guarantee because I can still picture him in my mind's eye. And he was bigger than Yokozuna. He was bigger than the Maguire to this motherfucker. He had mud flaps on the side of his mud flaps. And he's a big old white guy, right? And I'm thinking, and, and they said, of course, he weighed over a thousand pounds, but he had to be 800 and something easily. And wow. And then the next year we go to the fair and the sideshow and they had the banner world's fattest man. And I'm like, oh man, I can't wait. Here we go. I'm going to see this fucking guy again. I wonder if he's fatter than he was last year. And I go in there and it's some black guy and he was half the size of the world's fattest man. He was more personable. The world's fattest man just sat there and kind of stared at you. But this guy was flopping his big old man titties up and down with his hands and making jokes at the women and everything. 
but he was half the size of the real world's fattest man. He looked like sweet daddy Watts. And I could see him on TV every week. And I was just, and I never believed the, the banners of the advertising of the sideshow again. It was such a letdown. That was a great, when's the last time that was a you great saw story, the Jim. Well, when's the last time you saw the world's fattest man in person? In person? Yeah. Uh, I haven't been around Gino Moore. Well, he died now. But. Hey! <laughs> he never held the record. Did you ever Did you ever get to go see circus sideshows when you were a kid, or had they done away with all that fun? They did away with all that fun, I think. Son of a, a bitch. Kid. Well, you know what else somebody sent me real quick, and I say somebody because I don't know who. I got a box in the mail from Fantagraphics, and it's a biography of James Warren of Warren Publishing, who obviously launched Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine and then Creepy and Eerie and Vampirella and a whole empire of monsters. And its I haven't even had a chance to flip through that, except there's some color reproductions of covers and everything. And it's lovely, but I got a box with no note, direct from Fantagraphics, so please, somebody... Claim claim your prize. Thank you, whoever it may be. All right, and as some emails, I said we want to recognize some folks. Andrew from Yardley, Pennsylvania. I, I will not read it because it is a flattering email to you and me, Brian, about our shows. Um, and I don't want to seem too self-serving, but uh, Andrew said also he did lose his father to cancer recently. And he wrote such a nice email about listening to the shows in that time, I want to say, Andrew, thank you for listening to us when you had other things on your mind. We appreciate that more than, than you appreciate. You ain't going to tell us you appreciate us more than we appreciate you. Um, Sorry and, for your loss, Andrew. Well, yes, uh, in all seriousness, as I try to get smart alecky here with people I'm trying to be nice to. What's the matter with me? What's wrong with me, Brian? Raw rolls on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nick. Uh, I won't. I, he's a old time uh, member of the cult of Cornette. I won't give his last name, uh, but uh, but I know him. But Nick from Massachusetts uh, said, "Hey, Jim and Brian. Sadly, my wife Amanda and I had to let our ten year old cat Bobo pass away because he was starting to suffer. I would play your podcast, and he would meow toward the phone when you would get passionate about something." It was almost like he was telling you, fuck those guys. He was the greatest cat you could ever ask for. Both my wife and I are gutted as he and our other cat, Star, are our babies. And I want Nick and, and Amanda, we're sorry to hear about Bobo, but at least he had good taste in, in programming and podcasts, didn't he? Did you ever know any adults named Bobo? Because I have. Uh, well, yes, Bobo Brazil. Oh, then in Bobo, you know what? How did I forget about Bobo Brazil? I was thinking about kid. There's no wrestling connotation here, and then there is. Yeah. Well, and 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 Bobo Johnson, the midget wrestler, he was an adult, even though he was only three and a half feet tall. That he still chronologically qualifies. Have you ever known a white guy named Bobo? Oh, that gets tougher. See, I did. He died. He was a really good guy. He used to live in uh, Greenpoint, and hang out at Tommy's Tavern. This guy Bobo was the funniest guy in the world. And then he died. And he was a badass, too. I mean, he could, he could punch someone, but... Badass Bobo? But his name was a Bobo, which always made it a little funny to me. Just, you know, <laughs> this fucking badass street guy from Greenpoint has the name Bobo. Well, anyway. was his real name, like, Bob? Robert, Robert they, yeah. Robert, and Bob, and hey, it's Bobo. Whereas Bobo Brazil's real name was not anything remotely resembling Bobo. You know, it became so funny. The last time you said it, it hit me just how it's an all-time classic thing, all because of you talking about it. Bozo Brazier <laughs> is the greatest fucking story. Just him all dejected, reacting like that. 30 years in the business, and it's Bozo Brazier. All right, and moving, moving along, though. Uh, but, but and yeah, he got his name... At first, he when he started wrestling, like what forty nine or whatever, they used him on an outlaw promotion or shows or whatever, and he was like a a a, a goddamn what what was the name? He was supposedly either a cannibal or a savage savage from 
Brazil or something, and then it just kind of mutated. I can't. Somebody, Steve Johnson or somebody from the Wrestling Hall of Fame or whatever is going to uh, chastise me for not remembering that story. You ever see any of those early pictures of Bobo Brazil before he like really had the weight on him? And it almost looks yes. like a different person. Yeah. Facially yes. even. Like his face is a different shape almost. And, well, you know, it makes sense because he played baseball before he he played pro baseball, but it was a Negro League because that was before Jackie Robinson, but you couldn't be that heavy, I would think, and play baseball. But since he was so tall and had that frame, when he found wrestling and where he'd make more money, he, he gained the weight, and he was he never was fat. Even when he was, like, 60 years old, he didn't have, like, loose skin or fat rolls or whatever he was just always plump for like 30 years but he looked good in those you know the first 20 years of his career as opposed to the last 30 <laughs> hey you brought up the negro leagues i don't know if you know the story but i was actually looking for more information so i'll ask you here and we don't know what will come in from the listeners do you know anything about the negro league star oscar charleston either threatening to throw jim londis off a train <laughs> or getting into a physical altercation with Jim Londis, or backing down Londis, or Londis backing down him. Because I've heard various iterations of the story. I have the never heard bit. this at all. I finished this book a few months ago, Baseball 100, one of the best books I've ever read about baseball. I recommend it to everyone. Just the storytelling, it's amazing. And he's one of the highest ranked players in on the list. And no one really knows too much about him. He's one of these unfortunately forgotten stars of the Negro Leagues. Professional wrestling in the Negro Leagues, like the only things where there's like history just lost. Yeah. And he's one of the guys that when people try to piece things together, everyone talks about him being maybe the greatest star of the Negro Leagues. And there was just a line in the book about him threatening to throw wrestling champion Jim Londis off a train. I was like 700 pages in this book. And all of a sudden <laughs> the name Jim Londis pops up. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? So I went and looked into it, and I asked a couple of people, and I've heard a couple of different versions of the story, and there's not much info out there, but apparently it's known enough that it got into this mainstream book. So I figured maybe you knew something, but obviously you like I've me, never, you didn't know anything well, about it. Yeah, but at the same time, in those days, this guy, he wouldn't have had a platform to tell the story. And if it was... That's right. If it was the days where Londos was the... And I know somebody's going to say, oh, geez, Cornette and his wrestling, blah, blah, blah. If Jim Londos was the current champion at the time, he was one of the biggest sports stars in the country. And the Negro Leagues got practically no publicity whatsoever, except amongst their audience and never the twain met. So you could make a case that it was it was something personal. It wasn't like you know, the biggest star in baseball and the big star in wrestling, it was something personal that happened on a train. And of course, Londos is probably going to fucking back down because besides the fact that Londos may have known enough to stretch the average person on the street, but if it's another pro athlete and that nobody's ever heard of, nobody knows, and he's a star and he's about to get his ass whipped, he's probably going to bow out. Actually, I just looked it up. There's a website, oscarcharleston.com. And I looked at Jim Londis, and this is sourced from the August 3rd, 1935 Pittsburgh Courier. So I'm just going to read it as it is here. It's sourced from that. It's not verbatim from that newspaper. It seems that Oscar was traveling by rail to Harrisburg sometime in the early 1930s when he took a seat opposite a burly white man. After Oscar sat down, the man looked up and told him he would have to move as he was saving the seat for someone else. Oscar, perhaps sensing racism at play, flatly refused to comply, telling the man that if he didn't let him have the seat, one of them was getting thrown out the window. <laughs> at that, the band gave a hearty laugh. Before anything else could happen, a railroad employee leaned in and asked Oscar if he knew who the man was. When Oscar said no, the employee told him it was Jim Londis one of the most popular and chiseled professional wrestlers in the country. Oscar, taking another look at the Golden Greek, decided to find a different seat. Oh! So it, <laughs> How about that? It didn't even come to where Londos did have to say, okay, it was a, a pleasant ending to the 
situation where everybody was to that version and, and this joking. is on the official website you would think well we think it's the official website so oh my god yeah i'll just throw you off the train one throw of us is going out that train. window i love that line. Yeah. <laughs> well <laughs> you know what would have been the <laughs> ultimate fucking pop is if the guy jumped up and Dove out the window. <laughs> <laughs> well, that settles that. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Can you imagine right. Rod this is sitting there and he's like, oh, excuse me, I'm saving that seat for someone. Who knows who he had coming? His wife, his girlfriend, who knows? And the guy's like, I'm not moving, but if you, yeah, one of us is going out that window. <laughs> hey, maybe he was saving a seat for Strangler Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Uh, All right. Anyway, back to uh, not back to fun. the emails yes. here, real quick. Uh, this is from Daniel. Uh, you you remember that uh, his two Shih Tzus, Axe and Smash, the Shih Tzu demolition. We've talked about them on the program before. Uh, well, he says hi, Jim and Brian. Uh, just to thank you because, of course, cult members Axe and Smash, aka the Shih Tzu demolition, live here with me. And over the weekend, I've taken a tumble over one of their bean bags and broken my ankle in three places. Reconstructive surgery beckons and anything from a two to six week recovery period thereafter. So your podcasts are already keeping me sane and without them, the thought of the next month plus does not bear thinking about. So apparently we Jesus. keep people sane. Think of that How thing. the fuck do two people such as ourselves keep people sane? I don't know. How come we're not sane? How come we're keeping other well, people sane? That's what I'm saying. We can't manage to hold on to it for ourselves, but we spread it around with other people. All right, here's something we got to... Um, well, I'll hold on. I'll hold on to that. I want to bring up real quick, before we go into another discussion, uh, this won't take long, because I apologize again. Last week on the experience, the cameo video messages for Valentine's Day had just gone on sale, and by the time we were done recording, they were, it was an hour and five minutes. We went through 80. Actually, the automatic cutoff didn't work on the Cameo site. People were swamping. So Hotchkiss had to cut it off manually. And we did 83 of them in an hour and five minutes. So several people were writing, oh, please, can I get this or that? We're doing another day because we don't want to piss that many people off. Uh, but the day that or the week that we can schedule this, we want to give you advance notice. So the next round of cameos, and this is probably going to be the last one for a couple months because we've got some big things happening in the spring. Uh, Saturday, March 4th at noon Eastern, they will go up again for the people who missed out the last time as a make good. And I'll remind you guys of that as we go on and with the programs over the next four weeks but saturday march 4th at noon eastern if you miss the cameos you'll get another crack at them we'll talk more about that coming up and speaking of my boy hotchkiss i gotta praise my adopted son hotchkiss featherbottom have you heard of what he's done now i'm afraid to he, find out no he has invented this thing well it's amazing he calls it an email blast where you can email just a whole bunch of people all at the same time. Yeah, he and didn't he, he didn't invent that. That's a Yeah, he just came up with thing. this. He just he just told me about it like last week or week or two ago. And it's it's amazing because now I don't have to sit here because see that's one of the problems with me communicating with people is you know the time because I got so many people to talk to and I don't have to sit here and send email after I can send the same email to multiple numbers of people. It's amazing this kid I'm telling you he's on the ball. So what we are doing now, and also, you know, he made me the brand new state-of-the-art website and the whole big Cornets collectible store in the whole nine yards, and it doesn't crash and all the things that my old site used to do, and the inventory feature works. So what State of what art? Abstract art? It's, it's very abstract. It certainly is. He's amazing. I'm telling you. The kid, boy, you'd never know he never finished high school. But anyway, what he did over the weekend was we've been going through the warehouse and uh, AKA my garage and the vault because over the years I've sold a variety of different things, videos and shirts and, you know, books and et cetera, et cetera. But my inventory feature didn't work. So when I would get down to the nub 
and only have a few left, especially if it was going quick, I'd just guess of where to pull the plug. So I end up with 13 of one thing and 42 of another thing or whatever the case. And we uh, went through some shirts uh, last year on the site uh, that we had found that I, you know, didn't even remember I had. So this time we found the box. I had saved back one box. You remember when the Behind the Curtain graphic novel came out, the first thing that we offered was the special limited edition signed and numbered hardcover editions, which I had gotten only 1,500 of, and we couldn't get any more of those. And those sold in about three days. I think that's the first thing that crashed my old website back about four or five years ago. So anyway, I saved back one box for future reference, in case anything got lost, and I'd gotten two boxes extra because of, in case of damage or whatever, which as it turned out, there was some in, in shipping, the corners of the hardcover had been blunted or the top of the spine got scraped a little bit, and I put those back and didn't sell them. Well, Hodgkiss said, would you like me to put these up on sale on the site? And I said, well, there's only like 60 total by the time that we promote it it'll be gone and you know and people will be mad we said well let me do the email blast that i invented and i said that's a great idea so he did an email blast he just, said he invented it well yeah he told me about it a couple weeks ago he said i got this great idea so anyway well, that's different an idea to do it versus an idea no 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 he said i got this great of ownership idea. i'm gonna i'm gonna do something called an email blast <laughs> That's going to go to all the customers that have bought something from your website over since I built it and we set it up here this this past year. Okay, so it sounds like he did not indicate to you in any way that he invented it. You just decided to jump with that. Yeah, no, no, no. He said, yeah, I've come up with this idea. Nobody's ever done this before. He said that part? No one, you yeah. Didn't, that, you didn't say that before. You just added that to... Well, no, I told you. I, what are you uh, not understanding about? He's the one that had this idea. If you've ha if if you've heard from it or heard of it somewhere else, apparently somebody's stolen it from you. Because Hotchkiss, he's he's a sharp kid. How many fingers? Got, How many fingers does he have? Well, he started with eleven, but after the first fiasco, when I cut the two off, but one of them grew back. The nail is having a little problem coming in, but otherwise it looks... But nevertheless, I'm trying to explain to you what he did. <laughs> you sure are, yeah. So he sent this email blast that he invented out a, 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 about a day and a half ago to all of our customers, letting them know that this product was available. And son of a gun, wouldn't you know who won the pony? All 20 of the mint conditions signed a numbered hardcovers went like an hour, and then the rest of them were gone by the following midday so uh, unfortunately for the people who are listening to this it doesn't apply to you because they're already sold out we saw 60 of them or whatever there was but but another but, 30 are about to end up on the arcadian vanguard ebay no, page no, no. with a slight convenience fee but other than stop that a it. fair price for all stop it you they will not be see now you're you're just you're prevaricating to and fabricating to people here's what i'm trying to tell you if you're a customer of Cornette's Collectibles over the last year, then you already are signed up or qualify for these emails. When we find limited stuff or unique stuff or discontinued shit that we've only got a few of, we're not just going to put it up and advertise it to the whole world. We're going to let you people know about it first so you have the opportunity to get it before other people do. But if you have if you've been a customer in the past but not since we've had the new store in the last year you can still sign up cuz he's invented something else. He put this thing if you go to jimcornett.com and you go down to the bottom of the home page it says sign up for Jim's official newsletter and you can enter your email address and you will get these emails also. He invented that procedure where you can just put your email address in there and we'll send you these emails well maybe once a month or once every two months or whatever when we find other of these products for a limited audience and see isn't that it's convenient and nice of him and hotchkiss featherbottom is is he's using his head for more than just a hat rack which is 
good because as small as his ears are and the fact that they're down so low, it's off-putting. When he puts a hat on, it comes all the way down over his fucking bridge of his nose. Well, let's see if this works. You're bragging about it. Let's see if it actually works before we go any further talking about what a great job he's done. Well, no, it, it did work. He already did it. And it already, and then people bought these fine limited numbers of books. I didn't get an See? email. I didn't get an email. That's good. You haven't bought anything from me. Your prices are too high. You always tell me my prices are too low. Well, I got, I'm, I'm very picky where I purchase videos, items from. Jack up the autographs. Jack up the figures. I'm very picky where I, what stores I give my business to. Oh, come on. You're, je- you're tighter than the skin on a hot dog, and you will squeeze a nickel until the buffalo farts, and there, there is... And- <laughs> I'm t- I was there the one time in New York. You pulled a $5 bill out of your fucking wallet. And Abraham Lincoln didn't have a beard. He was clean shaven. That's the last time it had been open. So anyway. That was just a magic trick. But anyway, all right. All right. You're, you're exasperating. You will not give poor Hotchkiss any credit for all these innovations he comes. I'm telling you, he's on the innovations. cutting edge, Innovations. Get out of here. Innovations. Innovations. Of a thing, he is, he's, yeah. I'm telling you what, he's coming up with all kinds of things. I'll, I'll keep you. All those music video innovations you did as a producer. Well, that's right. As a matter of fact, he is, he's actually, well, I'll, I'll tell you that later. You know, I told you about his cooking show, his, well, his cable access show, The Velvet Colander, punk rock and cooking is the two of his interests. He's coming up with a way now that you can actually, where you can actually stream it right over the internet without putting it on television. Anyway, I got another email here. Ridiculous. From Eric from Pittsburgh. Hello, Jim and Brian. And this is something we got to discuss here. This is the state of affairs these days. Jim and Brian, you often wonder if the general public knows who the stars of wrestling are these days. We talk about this all the time. In the old days, depending on the part of the country, Everybody knew who their local wrestling star was. You rec- Even if you didn't watch wrestling on TV or go to the shows, you recognized the names. They were in the paper. They were on TV. They were live. They were, it was everywhere. Crusher in Milwaukee or fucking Lawler in Memphis or the Von Erics in Dallas, whatever the case. Hey, right? like we recently talked about on the show, Johnny Powers in Cleveland. Johnny Powers in Cleveland. And it was, so whatever the time period, Bruno in New York. And you, if, if, again, uh, people overlook the fact that just because everybody in New York City didn't go to wrestling or watch wrestling on television, you couldn't escape for a period of 10 or 15 years there hearing or seeing Bruno Sammartino's name on the TV news or in the newspaper or just around. So on the marquee at Madison Square Garden, how many people see that in the course of a day? So you knew the names, right? And then uh, with the national expansion, everybody in the 80s knew Hulk Hogan. Most people knew Ric Flair. And and, and in the Attitude Era, if you mentioned Stone Cold Steve Austin or The Undertaker, chances are a lot of people would know, right? But we say today, who are the stars? Or is anybody aware? So Eric from Pittsburgh continues. In Pittsburgh... There is a morning radio show where they ask general questions to the public and a pool of about eight to ten people see if they can answer them correctly or incorrectly. Questions can range from can you name a Mark Twain book to name three songs sung by Elton John. Well, that would be difficult. But the question of can you name any of the last ten WWE champions came up? Guess what the answers were, Brian? If you had to say what a pool of eight to ten normal people, what did they answer to the questions? The can you name any of the last ten WWE champions? You want me to guess names? Well, what do you think they said? The Rock, John Cena, Triple H, Hulk Hogan, uh, David Arquette. Uh, <laughs> Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart. Oh, 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 we, get, we get the point. They said The Rock, Hulk Hogan, and Goldberg. You see? Not one person could name one of the last 10 
WWE champions. And then the radio station, the perpetrator of the contest, then listed the 10 names for the people. Ed, would you like to hear some of the comments? Yeah. Roman Reigns. It was a unanimous who was everybody's response. Brock Lesnar. Oh, yeah, I forgot he came back. Bobby Lashley. The comment was, was he the dude that was with Trump and shaved Vince McMahon's head? <laughs> yeah, well, the answer is yes. You got yes. it. Yes, 15 years ago. Big E. The quote was, he sounds like an order of French fries. <laughs> After pulling up a picture of him, Someone said they named this guy Big E. Did anybody get fired for that? The Miz. Somebody said, oh, yeah, I think he's the star of the company. He was against John Cena at WrestleMania and The Rock interfered. I don't think I've watched a match since then. <laughs> and a side note, the guy who thought The Miz was the star of the company has never heard the name of Roman Reigns. Drew McIntyre, quote, never heard of him. Randy Orton, quote, he's still around? How old is he? Kofi Kingston, quote, he became a champion? Wow. Daniel Bryan, people didn't know his name, but everyone knew the yes chant with the finger pointing in the air. And lastly, the number 10, last 10 WWE champions, AJ Styles. And the, the, the quote here is, there is no quote because nobody knew the answer to that. Nobody knew poor AJ. And they saw the hair and they said Billy Ray Cyrus. <sighs> so, so Eric continues his thought or concludes his thought. If this is any indication, the answer as to if anyone can name these champions would be a resounding no. The general public is completely unaware of who the wrestling stars the, are these days. I think it's worse than people thinking it's silly is not even being thought of anymore. What are your thoughts on this, he says? Well, I th yes, actually, now come to think of it. Oh, Nobody knows the boys anymore. And so it's it's almost kind of now Vince's comment always was he wanted guys to turn head in airports and or turn heads in airports. Turn or turn head. head. Turn I want paralegals that turn head. Turn head or give head or he wanted people that turns the heads in the airports. Maybe there's something to that, but then again. Roman Reigns turns heads in airports, one would think, a striking, voluptuous fellow like that. But, but then if he turns the head, they go, oh, who's that big fucking guy? He looks great. Somebody ought to put him on television, make a star out of him. <sighs> I, what do you think, Brian? Uh, it's an ever-decreasing audience of us that still really want to be involved in supporting or enjoying or acting in or whatever this little world of ours and we're shrinking well plus i mean you have to be able to get over and you have to be able to be a star when you watch raw the way the show is formatted the idea wwe wants the company to be the star not the wrestlers there isn't a breakaway performer. Hulk Hogan stood out from the pack. He just did. Steve Austin clearly stood out from the pack. Cena did. A lot of that was the way he was used, but he was used like a star. And he's moreover maybe as a star today than ever before because of that. But who did they treat like that? Who? Roman Reigns. The guy that... Roman Reigns is it. Who? He's doing a great job. He's doing a great job on the one show that airs Friday nights every week. And I know it has more viewers than Raw, but it's a Friday night show. If you're 
someone who's just going to casually catch wrestling. That's the show you're going to catch. He's not even on Raw. Brock's there. Sometimes people have forgotten he came back. They're pushing Cody like a star. We've talked about this. They, they're they going back to the, the old WWF and Vince McMahon playbook and actually pushing him like a star. Everything's positive, presenting him as bigger than life. Hopefully that'll work. Um, but they didn't even mention Cody's name. Do you think anybody remembers Cody's around or knows Cody, who the fuck Cody is? AJ Styles has had more big time TV over the last five years than Cody. And they met him with a resounding who? Yeah, I'm, I know it's not scientific, but that's, you know. There are very few people, but there are very few people. If you look at WWE or AEW that you watch, and you think this person has the chance to even, because it's not like you could just put any wrestler in that spot; it'll work. It has to be the right Right. person too. There are very few people that you could see getting over to a general public beyond just wrestling like that. MJF's about to do a movie. I mean, it's a Von Erich movie, so we'll see how much attention it gets. That's one of those few guys that whenever you see him interviewed, seems to kind of get it. Roman Reigns, like you said, completely agree. But like Seth Rollins, you know, Cody right now, just because I think depends on how he's going to be used for a little while. These guys just aren't typical. Like Drew McIntyre. Drew McIntyre was in the main event of what, two WrestleManias in a row? Does he feel like that today? They don't know how to make a star and make it stick. COVID put his career on a ventilator. They changed all the shit that was supposed to be his year. But uh, I don't... I mean, I'm seeing what I'm seeing, and he's a great-looking guy and a great talent and size and everything, but there's not the the thing. There's not the thing that the... The, the, the 90s brought about not only the last vestiges of the territory stars that had all that, that experience and knew what they were doing, but also a, an amazing influx of the last group of guys that got into the wrestling business to get in the wrestling business, think about it the right way before it became holiday on ice and a fucking ring. And boy, that, that era of talent's hard to follow now. Plus also every single person we've talked about, the names grew, but it starts somewhere. You know, it starts in Pittsburgh and it grows from there. It starts in Cleveland and it grows from there. Now it's just, you're on a national stage. Here's the amount of time you get. So there isn't anyone who really grows locally and becomes a local name. Like when you see, I think it was Rey Mysterio recently went to, they did a show in San Diego. You could tell there's probably a good chance outside of wrestling fans, if you live in that area, maybe he's a wrestler you've heard of because he's a local guy. But there aren't too many cases like that, it seems like, anymore. Well, plus when the guys go home now, instead of running for mayor, they hide. (laughs) <laughs> stay out of the spotlight i got enough of that lawler was on every billboard in fucking memphis 30 years anyway um well before we go any further we should mention that um we lost actually we lost two people in wrestling business this last week uh sodbuster kenny J, the one of the most famous awa jobbers along with uh jake the milkman milliman he passed away this past week. I never met him, never met Kenny J and his heyday was mostly back in the seventies and early eighties before a lot of people even, you know, had video home video to see the AWA TVs or whatever. So he was primarily a Midwestern name, but, um, th- but he I just re- hated sod. He just couldn't, yes. <laughs> couldn't deal with sod. No, because he was, that was the deal. Like Jake Milliman, I think, was a milkman. And they said he's sod buster is another word for farmer. But uh, my friend Dale Spear knew him and said that he was a great guy, Kenny J. And he could actually wrestle if he wanted to. But he was one of those guys that, you know, spent his time putting people over on a part time basis. But there was a, uh, a newspaper article that somebody retweeted this morning. And shit, I can't remember who it was, but I retweeted it. Because he was mentioned, they were, when Jesse Ventura was governor of Minnesota, they were having some kind of debate in the state legislature or whatever. And it it was the headline was, one of the lawmakers says... It was Tim Pawlenty, I saw this. 
Oh, did you say, okay, in, instead of getting the crusher of all bills, we got the Kenny Sodbuster J of all bills. <laughs> and in Ventura, so, well, hey, I seem to remember that Sodbuster pin crusher one time. No, he didn't. He never, <laughs> never, ever did that. But, but anyway, that was where these guys got to be like kind of local cult figures. And they were remembered by people years and years later as our, you know, previous topic says nobody does anymore. And, uh, but anyway, so obviously hate to hear about that, but also then the second person was, and this came as a surprise to me and I still don't have any particulars on the cause, but, uh, leaping Lanny Poffo and, uh, better known to the WWF fans of the what eighties as the genius, but Lanny, uh, um, again, was always kind of a health fanatic and worked out. I last saw him at, I guess, with the Charlotte Fan Fest would have been four years ago, maybe five years ago, whatever. Probably the last one that I went to, I believe. Um, and he looked great, and I think he was 68 years old. Um, you know, I uh, I want to say that then, I, maybe I've talked to him on the phone. No. I tell a lie. I saw him there in Charlotte, probably 2018-ish, talked to him on the phone in 2019, I believe. And, uh, you know, so we had, we had not heard he was in any ill health or anything, don't know what was going on. But the thing that surprised me was he'd been living in Ecuador for the past few years. And you mentioned that you'd seen something, maybe his new wife or fiance, fiancé or whatever, uh, had family there. But I didn't know he was in Ecuador, but I, I hated to hear that. Lanny was a nice guy. Nobody had anything bad to say about him. And, you know, one of those guys, he was probably more of a character outside the ring than he was inside the ring, and that might be saying something. But um, he is the first guy that I ever saw, and to my knowledge, I don't know, can anybody, I'm sure somebody in Lucha or Mexico, maybe the Guerrero family, but the first person in American wrestling I ever saw do a moonsault and because La leaping Lanny Lanny was very gymnastic and that's back when that was not something you really needed to do or anybody did in wrestling of course he was what 6'2 or 6'3 and 220 or 30 pounds and had a really good upper body and etc so when he was doing cartwheels and backflips off the top rope and whatever it it still fit in with the wrestling of the time because you're like wow he's a big guy's doing that shit and he was a baby face predominantly in the icw days to counteract his brother randy savage and then um did how much of the old icw tapes have you seen the tvs i've seen most of what's out there I don't even know. And but I don't know how much of what's out there is the overall, whatever, four-year run or whatever. Right. Well, and see, there's not, I don't even have uh, the early stuff on video because, well, they came on the air before I got my first VCR, so somewhere in 1979. That was right after the Pafos had come back from working for who? Al Zink in Nova Scotia or wherever. It's crazy. He broke in in the middle of a wrestling war. In Georgia. Yes. Well, they were always kind of on, you know, in the middle of where there was a wrestling war going on. Uh, but the, the, the story was Angelo Poffo, who had been involved as a top heel and also an investor in Phil Golden's All-Star Wrestling that had tried to do Southern Illinois and Western Kentucky and Paducah, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, that area, and had expanded across into trying to run against Nick Goulas's towns in 73, 74, but they were really Jarrett's towns, but Louisville and Evansville and et cetera. Um, Angelo tried to do the same thing with his own company because the Poffos were from Illinois and Southern Illinois, that Harrisburg area down there and, and uh, the entire Phil Golden area, something he was interested in. It was an offshoot of his home. And they tried to do the same thing and joined with Ronnie Garvin, Bob Roop, Boris Malenko, and who am I leaving out? 
Uh, Bob Root, Boris Blanco, Ron Bob Garvin, Orton, Bob Orton Jr., Ron Wright. Well, Ron Wright, but Bob Orton Jr. specifically, the four guys, Ron Wright never worked ICW. No, but remember, before ICW started, the Poffos came down to work All-Star in Knoxville right. with those guys. Well, that, that's where I was going with this. For the purpose of this exercise, though, when Angelo had started ICW, because they were already outlaws, they were coming down to help the guys in Knoxville, but they absorbed, when the Knoxville outlaw promotion didn't last long, they absorbed Orton, Garvin, Malenko, and Roop. And, and that Ron just didn't, wasn't interested enough to come to Lexington and do their whole thing up here and in that end of the territory. But anyway, the point was, Lanny was the top baby face for Angelo and Randy was the top heel. And at the time, nobody knew they were brothers. And because they were so completely different, the only thing that would give it away was the deep voice. They both had the deep voices, but since they were so completely opposite, you had to be get to the level of the you know the local hanger on bell ringer smart fan or whatever level to know that they were related. And you know Garvin and Roop and Orton and Malenko. Malenko didn't didn't stay long, and I, as I recall, he just moved back to Florida and retired. Roop and and. Uh, Garvin stayed longer than the, the most of them. Roop and Orton ended up leaving after, what, two years and, and getting a spot with Watts. And Garvin was there for quite a while and finally left and I think went to work for Ole in Atlanta. But you could tell that Lanny and Randy were the guys, obviously, Angelo depended on. And, even, and, no, and Angelo was the miser under a hood because he didn't want to, as old as he was then, he didn't want anybody to see his face and also the, to know that he was Lanny's father. So when the show first went on the air in Lexington, they had done a marathon taping at uh, the old Channel 62, now it's Channel 36, in their studio, and Rip Rogers was just breaking in at that point. He had worked a little bit for Nick Goulas and had met Randy and Lanny because they'd been working down there, and Randy taught Rip, you know, a majority of what he knew about wrestling at that point. And Past that and the guys from Knoxville, it was kind of, you know, Doug Vines and Jeff Sword were these, uh, you know, outlaw guys. There was no independence outlaw guys at the time from Eastern Kentucky and a guy named Big Boy Williams. And later on, they'd get Pez Watley, but they didn't have him right there. So it was a hoot kind Gibson. of... Hoot They had a Hoot Gibson. They had an actual Hoot Gibson. And boy, he was about five foot six and tubby. And he was a guy from East Tennessee that could get them some towns and <laughs> but it was a motley assortment of of talent you had these you know international superstars in Roop and Garvin and Orton and Malenko and then you had one of the best wrestlers in the world Randy Savage that nobody almost had ever heard of and then you had underneath guys it was fucking brutal and of course every once in a while they'd find somebody Crusher Broomfield became the one man gang and you could tell at the start, you know, he was something. But the TV show, when they first did a, the ta the first taping to go on the air, they did like eight hours, eight one hour shows in the same day. And not only did they do the old deal where they had a backdrop with like shaded figures painted on it, like for the audience, but they couldn't even fill up two rows in the studio. So they had the underneath guys and the job guys put on coats and hats and go sit in the second row and fucking just clap and keep their heads down so they had a crowd. But they put this, and it came on Saturday nights at 11.30, which was almost about the time that the station went off the air back in those days. But where I was going with all this was, if you overlooked the most low-budget presentation, especially at the start you've ever seen, and this 20 fans maybe in the studio and the, you know, the, the announcer that they had usually didn't really know too much about wrestling, but there's Randy Savage having matches with Ronnie Garvin or Randy and Lanny. I think they did a deal. I'm pretty sure it was the whole hour where they did a ICW world heavyweight title match in front of 15 people in the studio and aired it on at that time, like three stations late at night, 
where Lanny and Savage went an hour. And it was fucking, because they were doing more advanced in-ring stuff than a lot of people were doing at that point in time. And you didn't get main event matches on TV. And I know some people would say, well, a main event in a fucking phone booth, but this was, again, Randy Savage. So, you know, there was moments of sublime, you know, wow, this is fucking great wrestling on that show, and moments of this is the cheesiest booking and the most low-rent job guys and the most haphazard production you've ever seen in your life. But it was a, And then they got a little bit better the second and third year as a television show, but the first ones, man, I wish I had tapes of some of those. It was insane. But Lanny, again, doing the moonsaults and the high drop kicks and stuff, but he was a he was a nerdy baby face because he was the classic white meat, you know, baby face that didn't curse or smoke or drink or thin. He, he would be the guy drinking the milk. And opposite a guy like Randy Savage, who was starting to, for the fans in eastern Kentucky, and they they did do some some business down in the mountain towns in eastern Kentucky when southeastern was out of business and Jarrett didn't go over that far. They probably drew better houses in places like Combs and Manchester than they did in Lexington and Frankfurt. But the young guys were starting to get behind Randy Savage, kind of like the free bird effect that, that it would have in Dallas a few years later. This was 1979-1980. But Savage was so fucking... He he was coming out still doing kind of the same interviews. It's just there was no budget to it, which made him seem even more like a fucking madman. He wouldn't come out and have this sequined, you know, macho man robe and Elizabeth, and he'd be spinning around. He'd come out in goddamn whatever he wore to the station that day, which looked like what he fucking slept in for the past three days, and he'd go... Ooh, macho man, dig it! And he'd pull a fucking handful of confetti out of his own jacket pocket and throw it up over his own head. And, you know, but you thought he was fucking insane. And then here was Lanny was the opposite of that, was the soft-spoken and, you know, deep voice, but articulate baby face that's going to right a wrong. And it was, it was, it was some interesting shit. Possibly over articulate if you actually want fans to possibly over articulate, yes, because he would he would run off and leave them sometimes because Lanny was a very smart guy. But anyway, and then you know later on when they made up with Jarrett and Lanny was a heel because he was with Randy and and they were doing a thing with Lawler, but and then of course you know the genius the poetry was all his that was kind of you know it was a very true to life gimmick. And I saw people tweeting, you know, the the Frisbees and everything that uh, he would have the poem on it and he'd sign the Frisbee and then sail it out a- into the crowd after he read it. I'm sure now people be calling Stephen P. New with fucking putting some kid's eye out. But, uh, and as I mentioned, I'd seen him in, in Charlotte and talked to him on the phone. He is the one, I found out, Mary Furpo, Mary Freeze, that uh, is Pampiro Furpo's daughter, big fan of the show, had never met her and didn't know about it. And Lanny had called me out of the blue one day and said, I, w- I want you to know, Jim, that she's she's a wonderful person. She's not a stalker, but I didn't want to give her your information without asking your permission. I said, no, please. And and I said, who gave it to you, Lanny? Yeah, no, come on now. Um, uh, I did say, I actually said, how did you get my No, um... But anyway, so so, uh, I just, anyway, I hate to hear that. So now all three Poffos are gone. And that's that's a pretty heavy family. That's a pretty crazy thing. Again, I mean, it was only three of them, but there's been a Poffo in or around wrestling for 70 years. And now, yep, that's it. And, well, think about this. Angelo started out uh, in his career, he was on the Dumont Network broadcasts, and Randy Savage not only ended up being on network television, NBC, whatever, uh, 35 years later, but you since they put him, you know, he's all of the home video and all of the blah, 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 he's seen now in more play, Randy Savage is in more places than 
you could almost see wrestling, even though no, not as many people are watching it. It's available everywhere. So there's been some member of the family on television or being able to be seen by the public all that time. And, and you know, it's the profile is bigger now than it ever was. I wonder what happens to Randy's. I don't know if a state would cover it, but, you know, the, all the issues where they license out the Randy Savage stuff. So it's beyond just WWE. I could be wrong, but I think they were dealing with Lanny. Well, but at the same time, I get Randy was married. So at that's the time, true. that's true that he passed away. So there would be somebody to still have control over it or whatever. Even I mean, it would probably have gone to his wife anyway, but I'm sure Lanny was the spokesperson for whatever. But anyway, the, um, the noted humorist Scott Cornish and me were texting about it the other day. Noted humorist? The, the wrestling humorist Scott Cornish, and he actually summed up my thoughts with this text. My reaction to Lanny Poffo's passing has been, in this order, surprise, sadness, wildly inappropriate humor. Rest in peace, leave a gladdy. And I have to admit, because that is part of the story, just because so many people, he even enjoyed talking about it. Well, wait, Alan Blackstock say. on Twitter posted a bunch of Lanny's poems from, I think, the WWF years, and I found myself reading them to myself and ending everyone the same way with, also, I suck my own dick. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I know. And I think a lot of other people did that, too, because it's a funny part of the Lanny Poffo story. No, go ahead and say it, because you got to say it the right way. He has the greatest quote of all time when people, he said, people ask me if I'm gay. No, the only penis I've ever had in my mouth is my own. See, I didn't even know that and, was the line he used, actually. Yes. <laughs> and because it's true. And the thing is, and that is, when you got close around the wrestling back in the early 80s, you would hear this story. Because Lanny not only was a, a gymnast, but was very flexible and was flexible. And Here, to watch. To entertain, you know, various people either in the locker room or, you know, whatever, wherever the case may be, at, you know, weddings and bar mitzvahs, wherever the, they <laughs> yeah, came where? up. He always said it was an old parlor trick. What well, parlor? Yeah. What well, parlor are people doing this trick in? <laughs> in a number of parlors. Um, <laughs> and I, I, you know, used to know a girl in Dayton that was amazed by it. Always would request to see it, but Man, nevertheless. I, I am so bored in this locker room. Does anyone have a deck of cards? Shit, I left the cards somewhere. Does anyone well, have a, a comic book or a magazine? Oh, no, no one has anything. Oh, wait a minute. Watch this. <laughs> oh, shit. There's Lanny blowing himself. <laughs> and Sam. And, 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 it, and, and I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to say this next day. It was really amazing because it wasn't like you could maybe understand if it was Virgil or Robert Fuller. But while while it, he was not shortchanged by nature, it was more of the 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 element of the flexibility rather than the extension of the. It's not how big you are; it's how much you can bend in half and suck it's, your own dick. Yes, it's 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 it was he could, you know, because you're bending there not at the waist, but you're. <laughs> it's sort of almost an unnatural direction that the spine has to go. To. But we are definitely sorry to hear about yes. the, uh, no, and I, I kid, I never had any issues with Lanny and we were always very friendly. So I hate to hear about this, but I guess that'll teach you to move to Ecuador. I don't know what he was the picture of health. Hey, how different do you think his career would have been, whether you like the gimmick or not? He was the guy for it. If he had come in as the genius versus coming in as leaping Lanny, throwing Frisbees, kind of getting beat everywhere. Yeah. And then he became the genius. Well, it probably would have helped because, again, and I guess a lot of people may not even remember that they did bring him in. And, of course, because Savage is on top, I'm sure, and you know, Pat Patterson would, would, would have known Angelo for years. And Lanny, just as leaping Lanny Poffo, the baby face in 1985 or six or whatever it was in the WWF was not going to get over because he was 
way too white bread, you know, nerdy baby face, territorial kind of baby face. But it, he had when, none of the qualities you want in a baby. He was like, I wear a suit of armor. <laughs> well, no, but <laughs> but no, that was after he didn't. They didn't send him out there in a suit of armor at first. <laughs> that you know, but that's what I'm saying is then they decided, well, we'll make him the genius or a heel or the you know, the pompous fellow uh, afterwards, and he probably would have got more heat if he hadn't been been beaten around the horn but in in a lot of cases he took heat because he got jobs because of you know randy but they didn't necessarily because he might get hired because of randy they didn't necessarily put the effort into his booking or his presentation or his gimmick that they would have if it if they'd have just hired him and he could have done a better job with it he was kind of pigeonholed in the, in the middle. How long was he on the WCW payroll? Remember, they were going to bring him back as Gorgeous George. There are photos out there of him with blonde hair because Randy owned oh, the yeah. IP for Gorgeous George. And then he just got paid for years and they never used him. Well, Robert, Lanny was a bleach blonde heel for the Sheik in 70, what, five or six, though. So th- th- he had experience with the uh, the hair bleaching. But at that point, yeah, that w- he's one of the people that got a job from WCW just to 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 breathe and go to the mailbox but at that by that time he'd been in the business for fuck 20 years i don't blame him for just wanting to sit home if they were willing to send him a check at that point well we uh send our sympathies to the family and friends of leaping lanny poffo well we know he had friends but we've just established does he have any family left for heaven's sake uh judy their mother passed away here not too long ago angelo's been gone Randy, etc. There were maybe well, somebody will have to call uh, uh, Gorgeous George the uh, the valet and see if she can carry on the name. <laughs> I don't know if that'd be the pick. There may be some heat. Yeah, there. what a little heat. A little heat. Jim, a live update: the Chinese spy balloon is now over North Carolina. Shit! Did it pass us already? It must have. I heard yesterday Son it was going to go gun. by you. Well, I had I had asked them if they wouldn't mind swinging by and dropping some new action figures off on the way oh, across on. Louisville. Well, it's easier than waiting for that damn boat. <laughs> I guess so. People want their figures. They want them now. When they want something, they, you know, that's the thing, Brian. When people want something, they don't want to wait months and months and months. They want it now. And that's exactly what the people over at our friends at West Shore Home want to give you and want to do for you is do something right now. As a matter of fact, they want to do it yesterday. What are you waiting on? You're just wasting your own time now. Folks, they just come with the program. We got to introduce you to our friends, as I said, at West Shore Home. They're the fastest growing shower and bath remodeling company in the United States. And if you've seen the TV commercials, they're everywhere because this is a big time deal. They've got their fingers in all kinds of pies over at West Shore Home. If you've seen the commercials, they fully replace your old shower or bathtub with the modern, state-of-the-art, space-age stuff they've got in one day. And the way they do that, they send somebody, you schedule this, by the way. They don't just send somebody that's going to show up. You schedule the free in-home remodeling preview, and one of these know-it-alls that knows everything about this comes over to your house when it's most convenient, mornings, afternoons, evenings, weekends, the overnight shift, whatever. Invite them to come in at 3 o'clock in the morning. There is no overnight overnight, uh, offerings at this time. Offerings? (laughs) There are no... Well, I know when they they do the bathtub and shower remodel on some of these massage parlors they got to go in after hours about four o'clock in the morning but anyway what they'll do is they'll send somebody over to your place when you want to see them and that's their design consultants is what they are and you sit down with them and build your dream shower or bath now depending on what your dreams are like i don't know if they can do everything for heaven's sake you might have to worry about a skylight with somebody else but They've got laser-etched designs, built-in seats, shelves, doors, windows, magnetic shower heads. Just watch out you don't get your car too close. As you're driving by, it'll fucking zam right onto the fucking outside wall, jerk you with it. 
But then once you've got all that established, a couple of days later, the remodeling professionals do a one-day bath replacement, and they have the time-lapse photography on these TV commercials where they take out the old shit and they put in the new shit. They do all the cleanup, and it's ready to use before dinner. And as we mentioned on the program last week, I didn't know that it was a an old custom that people would have dinner in their brand new bathtub or shower, but I guess, that, is that what they do up in the Northeast, Brian? It's just not a Southern tradition yet? Do we do what in the Northeast? You have dinner in your bath, new bathtub or shower. It says right here, and they promise, they will have this bathtub or shower ready to use before dinner. Before dinner? I, it has nothing to do with having dinner in the bathtub. Well, what the fuck do you care whether it's ready by dinner or not, as long as they're still going to do it the same day? You can eat dinner in your dining room unless you're going to eat dinner in your shower or bathtub. Well, no, I think the idea is that some people are not comfortable sitting down and relaxing and having their evening meal while there are people still working in the house. They'll be out of your house and done, and everything will be ready to go so you can take a nice shower right after your nice dinner. Well, but then, uh, now don't they get to eat something? Aren't you going to offer them some dinner? Since they've been you. working at your house all day? There's no obligation whether you feed the people that are helping you or not is up to you. I don't even know well, why we're putting this least, out there. You could at least give them a snack. But you don't Do you have feed to the Munros? Finger. Do you feed the Munros? Yeah, I have. You have or you do? I've, I've given them, so I'll, I'll look at some stuff in the freezer. I'll say, Stace, that's freezer burnt. I think it'd poison us. You want to give it to the Munros? Oh, that's horrible. Shit like that, but you don't have to lift a finger on these bathtub and shower remodels because they do all the work for you. And as a matter of fact, as we said, it's a one-day remodel. They guarantee, I'll tell you what, here's what they do. If you become one of these installers, the remodeling professionals over at West Shore Home, every day when you go into work, you have to take either your wife or one of your children. If you're a single person, you've what? got to take your dog with you. And you're going to leave, the, they leave them at the main office. And then what? they go out and they do the installation. And if they know they have personal skin in the game now. If they don't want anything bad to happen, they need to get that installation done that day. So these son of a bitches, when they show up at your house, they're motivated to get this job done and that, done right. That isn't how it works, ladies and gentlemen. And Let's, then if they do it like no. they're supposed to and get it done in one well, they day, will. they go back yeah. to the main office and pick up their loved one. There is no, fine. for the record, for the listeners and any law enforcement listening, there's no kidnapping involved in this process. They're not, they're not, no one's them being held they're captive. Just holding them. No one's being held. The fine people at West Shore Home will come out at a time you agree with, and they'll do the work that you want them to do. They'll finish in a quick and orderly fashion. You'll be happy. They will leave. You will sit down and have dinner and then take a bath. Well, it sounds what's more so fun complicated the way that about I all said. that? Sounds more fun the way that I said it. But folks, right now, fun. You need to call West Shore Home. I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to be, as a matter of fact, doing what? I'm going to be calling West Shore Home. They're oh. going to be doing a lot of stuff around the the castle this year. Now that I've found them, I'm sorry I didn't know them when I did this last round last year. And now I'm going to make up for that. And they're going to be over here. They're going to be doing a variety of things. But folks, you need to call West Shore Home if you live in or around the following cities where they are available to serve you. What are Louisville, those cities? Lex huh? <laughs> what are those cities? I'll be glad to tell you what these cities are. Louisville, Lexington, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Richmond, Salisbury, Virginia Beach, Winston-Salem, Charlotte, Greenville, Asheville, Knoxville, Chattanooga, Charleston, Wilmington, Myrtle Beach, Greenville, New Bern, Columbia, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Orlando, Ocala, Tampa, Birmingham, Huntsville, Montgomery, Oklahoma City, Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, Phoenix, Denver, Colorado Springs, and Salt Lake City. And they do windows and doors. But I don't have enough fucking breath to tell you all about that. So get on their website to see which locations you can request the free window and door remodeling preview, where they will preview the windows and doors they will remodel for free. That's why they call it that. And then they'll just remodel them, but not for free. But it's cheap. Folks, you'll be you'll love them. They're just a phone call away. I'm I'm swearing to you right now, all you got to do is check out promo.westshorehome.com backslash Jim, promo.westshorehome.com.
westshorehome.com backslash Jim. Is that just a regular slash or is a backslash different than a regular slash? Well, there's no honor in a backslash. I've heard that. But you'll get the fastest, easiest, and most convenient home remodeling experience that you'll ever have. You won't li- have to lift a finger, not not especially not a middle finger, like I've given to some of my other remodeling people with the folks at West Shore Home. All right, let's talk about some of the wrestling from last week on television, right? Let's uh, we'll go in chronological order. Last Wednesday night's Dynamite, because Wednesday comes before Friday. Right? Uh, not, a, not in Australia or Japan. Well, that's only if you're flying backwards. That's, this is what Hulk Hogan told me. I don't know. Well, anyway, speaking of flying backwards, we're in Dayton for this episode. of <laughs> Dayton is 50 miles from Cincinnati, so it's close enough to be Johnny Scissorhands' hometown. Uh, so Johnny does, Scissorhands? Johnny Scissorhands, <laughs> old John Moxley. He makes his entrance through the crowd, not only with who he was with Wheeler Useless, who wasn't even announced, but (laughs) he's also maybe they're mad at him, too. But he's also accompanied by his father, who didn't play any part in the match and was never seen again. But it I guess he thought it would be cool to have his dad walk him down the fucking general admission aisle. Almost close to home. He's the father of a plumber, baby. The father of a plumber. So they start out with the the long-awaited babyface versus babyface scientific confrontation between Plumber Moxley and Hangnail Page. I, you know, I know Moxley has his appeal, and I, uh, every week, kind of try to see it. And I, 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 it's almost a rib at this point. So we thought, well, is, is Moxley the one that's trying to turn heel on page because he was being such a dick, but then page was kind of a dick too, but that's kind of him naturally. So we weren't sure. Well, now there, since they're almost in Moxley's hometown, the people are cheering predominantly for Moxley to kill Adam Page, which it looks like he's trying to do from the first moment of the match. And this makes me, again, think back to all the great promoters, including Vince Sr., who said, I don't want to have Bruno versus Andre because the fans are going to have to boo one of them. The fans are going to pick which one they like. That's He didn't want to have Bruno and Pedro. And Page does not need any help getting people to dislike him, and the wrestling fans at least, but nevertheless. So the match. Moxley jumps him in the aisle, bashes his head into the stairs, runs him into the railing, chokes him with his ring jacket, throws him over the rail into the crowd, kicks the shit out of him in the arena, and puts a figure four on him on the concrete floor. What a fucking scientific match we've got going on here. And then they came back to ringside where Moxley hit Page with a chair and was going to try to pilmanize his leg. Again, I've talked about this where, yes, guys can get mad at each other and want to fight, but what has either one of these guys done to the other one besides knock each other out that you want to cripple them, break their leg, fucking put them out of... That is a heels position to want to end a guy's career. It's not a... not a, If Moxley's trying to say that he's the fucking tough guy that wants to fight, is he still, that means he's also an asshole and a criminal and he'll fuck people up for good just because they beat him once? Or does that mean that he's the fucking guy that wants to win a one-on-one man against man fight with his bare hands because he's tougher like a kick-ass baby face that i don't know what the fuck these pit they're just doing shit to each other with no thought that anybody might think it's real because they know that the way they're doing it nobody will but anyway so when hangnail grabs a chair uh, grabs the chair that Moxley was going to use to break his leg and flings it and hits Moxley in the head with it. 
and then suplexes him on the floor on top of the chair and rolls him in the ring. And Moxley is staggering over to the far corner while Page is trying to bring the chair in and the referee's trying to tell Page, don't do that. And then, Brian, you know where I'm going with this because this not only this not, was not something that I saw as a trained observer. This was something that people were fucking clipping and putting up on Twitter and making fun of before I ever even watched this fucking program. Moxley sits down in the ring in the corner with his back to the turnbuckles and the camera gets a close-up of him pulling his blade out of his mouth, gigging himself over the right side of his eyebrow, and then putting the blade underneath the apron skirt, dropping it down underneath the ring. Now, he got... I know what he was trying to do because you're going to say, well, who'd hit him in the head? Well, nobody. He got hit in the head with a chair like 45 seconds before that. But as he comes out of the corner, then Paige clocks him with a big forearm to the side of the head, and that's supposed to be what busted him open. He was just doing a preemptive gig. But he didn't bother. Not only did he not bother to in any way cover up or disguise what he was doing. He just thought that in a building with 5,000 people in it, that nobody would be looking at him sitting in the middle of a ring lit for television, cutting his own head with a razor blade. But at that exact moment, the director thought it'd be a great idea to go to a close-up of Moxley. And by the way, right after that, then the bell rang to start the match. Seven minutes into this fucking arena brawl that they got going on. Did, did, did you see this the first time or were you paying close enough attention that you even gave a shit? But you, I'm sure you heard about it on Twitter. I did not see it the first time because I was watching it, but I wasn't paying too close of attention. They were brawling around for a long time. I'm not a big fan of the two. And I was looking forward to this episode. I ended up not liking this episode. And this match got me, got it started on the wrong foot in my eyes. Got you started going downhill or uphill or whichever one's bad. There's a hill and I don't like it. So after they have bashed each other with furniture, fought all over the arena, they get in the ring, the bell rings, start the match, and they start wrestling. And <laughs> Moxley tries and fails to put an Indian death lock on Paige. He started it and couldn't figure it out and just had his leg in between Paige's legs and just put his other foot over on Paige's knee and pushed. Then Paige started getting heat on Moxley, and now Moxley, because he's close to his hometown, he's working like a bird, selling like a baby face. And it's the first time I've actually seen him try to sell anything. But basically, they teased a spot on the apron forever, and then Paige Fireman's carried Moxley up on his shoulders and just tossed him like a sack of fucking wheat into the ring post, and that's the break spot. So they come back, other side of the break, Paige gives some kind of fucked up thing to Moxley off the top rope. And Moxley starts his comeback with a double bird and a cutter. Hey, I'll get to it in the end. It's, he's not done with his birds or his, for the lip readers in the audience. But then, honestly, if you just showed me the 30 or 40 seconds of, of the next thing they did, the forearm and chop exchange, I would say, well, this looks like a really good match. Because they actually did a nice exchange with body language and not standing there and going, come on, hit me, and blah, blah, blah. They exchanged with the selling and the registering and the we're laying the forearms in. Okay. I guess that's the blind squirrel principle. But immediately after that, Page belly-to-back suplexes Moxley, and Moxley he drops him right on his head, and Moxley gets right up without selling it and gives Page one. And he sold it. <laughs> And the announcers even had it. Well, Moxley rolled through with that. No, he didn't. He looked exactly the same as the one he gave Paige. He just didn't bother to sell it. And then Moxley gives Paige a front face lock superplex off the top rope for a two count. And then 
And Moxley gets the choke and the pissy stomps and the cross arm breaker and Paige gets the ropes. They're trying to have a classic and they're doing a lot of good moves that get pops. But the problem is neither one of them can put a fucking logical match together. Hence the reason why they had the best part of it. Seven minutes before the bell rang, they're going backwards. And then I, I was gratified by one thing. When Paige backdropped Moxley over the top rope and went for his moonsault off the top to the floor, Moxley moved. And Paige actually missed since he didn't bother to look at the guy that he was flipping on like he never does for the previous 30 or 40 seconds. Was this a no DQ match or just lazy booking? I don't know. Did they? Because, I mean, it's it's all the same in AEW. Moxley tries to powerbomb Paige through a table, but Paige turns around, does it to him. Moxley beats the 10 count. That's why, is it no DQ or no count out or just AEW because they've been on the floor, they've been out, they've, they've used the furniture, blah, blah, blah. Um, and Finally. Moxley foiled the buckshot. Page came out with a tombstone pile driver and hits Moxley with it and doesn't even try to cover him. Rolls out and goes for a buckshot lariat. Good thing he didn't cover him because Moxley was on his feet standing up by the time that Page could roll to the apron and do the buckshot. And Page hit that. Two count. So within within 15 seconds of each other a tombstone pile driver and the fucking guys finish two count and then page gets the fucking choke on him the bulldog choke and the announcers are saying the heart and guts of moxley on display here how about the egotism and outlaw wrestling mind because now here <laughs> This guy's been tombstoned. He's been buckshotted. He's already bleeding. He's being choked out. And suddenly, Moxley just rolls out of the choke and pins page one, two, three. Just like that. And the announcer, uh, he got a, uh, he I think Taz said he stacked him up. <laughs> what the? F he got tombstoned. He got buckshotted. He's already been bleeding. He's had his shit kicked out of him. He's being choked out, and he just flying married the guy over forwards and pinned him one, two, three. And then Paige and Moxley start shoving at each other and arguing at each other, and here's Claudio and Useless, and they get in between. And right before we don't have to see any more of this horse shit, uh, Moxley manages to get another double bird on camera and a close-up of him mouthing the words, Fuck you for all you lip readers out there. So he continues to be a detriment to their fucking continued good relations with their network and the world's champion garbage wrestler. You can count on him to in any situation bleed and cuss and be a problem. Your thoughts, Brian? I wasn't a big fan of the match. I wasn't a big fan of this episode. Moxley's gotten the word fuck on TV more than anyone else. He mouths it. He gives the fucking double bird, like you said. He's blading on camera. Gets his friend, gets his wife hired. I mean, no one has gotten more from AEW, and yet this is what you get. I mean, this is the best of what you get right here. And I think, you know, you kind of hit on my big thing on Moxley. I could kind of understand why some people like him. I just can't understand how they do based on his matches or his personality or anything he does in a wrestling ring. Maybe it's his plumbing. He does great plumbing work. I thought what he was going to like celebrate with his dad and point, look at all these fans. Look at what your son has done. <laughs> no, we just see some guy come to the ring with him. It's his dad and him and Wheeler on one side and the security fleet on the other side <laughs> to make sure every, no one gets near them. Every member of security looks like a bigger badass than John Moxley, who, again, looks like an emaciated fucking homeless meth addict that's been living under a fucking trailer somewhere. All righty, then. They did a package on Darby and Joe. Uh, Joe sounds great. I, uh, again, was reminded why Darby Allen doesn't speak very much. But then here comes the acclaimed. And I'm going to, again, 
AEW has had a string of shows over the last few weeks. They, the Jay Briscoe tribute, Mark Briscoe and Jay Lethal, great match. You know, they've, they've, they've had a couple of uh, decent ratings in a row, but and, and I'm not knocking the acclaimed here, but they're determined to. They're determined to shoot these kids in the foot. So they do their entrance, the acclaimed and Billy Gunn. Caster does the rap. Two guys in the ring, nobody said their names, they got no graphic, and they looked badly like two indie guys that were, honestly, that Dennis Corluzzo fucking booked in 1993, and they got lost and never found the building. And the fans were chanting, Scissor Me Daddy, because they loved the acclaimed. The jobbers ridiculously overacted and then milked, scissoring each other, and it acted even more foolish when they did it. And then, because they scissored each other, apparently that was supposed to make the claim mad, so Bowens goes over, and did you see this, brother, super kick bump? Yeah, I watched. Bowens super kicks one of the job guys, and the job he staggered backwards and leaned into the top rope, and his intention was to be super kicked backwards over the top rope. But because he was the shits, he just leaned back into the ropes, and then once he was on the rope, he obviously, visually, on purpose, kicked his feet up near a baby and flipped backwards over the top rope on purpose. And then they double-teamed the other clown, and then Billy Gunn got in the middle of the ring, and they all scissored, or they scissored with the acclaimed right in the middle of the match, and then Caster went up and dropped the elbow off the top rope, one, two, three, and that was the match. And uh, I know I'm saying Are they trying to sabotage the tag team division? Because we went from, you know, if you're a fan of the Bucks, you're getting a high quality Bucks matches when they were the tag champs. So you're fans of the kind of wrestling that FTR did when they were champs. You got that kind. You've had various kinds of tag teams. And right now, the acclaimed are becoming more of a WWE style tag team than an AEW tag team traditionally, more yeah. about skits than anything in the ring. And then this feud with the guns, and I like the guns, but I don't know. This feud with the guns has kind of been awful. All sorts of awful, really. <sighs> well, and again, yeah, so they have the. It fit in on Raw, though. I Yes, it would. And I say that the acclaimed should or i say that anybody young guys should get squash wins on tv and get wins to rack up their record but not in 30 seconds after the one job guy so bad he exposed the business before the bell rang but this was if you're not gonna give it any time to be taken seriously they don't need a match if it's just 30 seconds of wising off but then that's when the gun boys come to the ring because apparently they were running long too. So they need to get out there and they want a title match. And the gun boys have shown that having some energy and emotion in the verbal part of their game, their promos is apparently what they're struggling with. But then there was one line and not very convincing. They won a title match. But then Bowens fires up good. And as good as Caster is with the raps, Bowens is with the promo. And, of course, he asked fans, do, do they deserve a title shot? And fans said, no. So they shove and bicker. And Billy Gunn then says, hey, I've had enough. Go ahead and beat the shit out of each other. And he starts to walk out. And then one of the sons tells him, yeah, go do what you used to do when we were kids. Drown your sorrows in the bottom of a pill bottle. Well, for one thing, you can't drown in the bottom of a pill bottle. It's too big. You've mixed your metaphors. It's <laughs> drown your sorrows in the bottom of a whiskey bottle. Uh, but nevertheless, that makes Billy mad. He turns around, comes back. And he tries to give them the match, but the original microphone he had, same problem he had a couple weeks ago, it was feeding program, but not the house. So he had to throw that away and get another one and did better at covering it than Moxley did and gives them the match next week, which confuses the acclaimed. Now, hopefully, they are not stupid enough to fuck with... <laughs> 
the acclaimed being with Billy. Because the acclaimed are getting a whole lot more out of Billy, and Billy's getting a whole lot more out of the acclaimed than Billy would if he was with his own sons and they were a heel team. And the sons can be fine without Billy. But I smell a rat here. What do you think, Brian? I'm not like any of the booking with the acclaim for a while. They got themselves really over, and it feels like there's a mission to get them under. Again, they're not feuding with another top team. The tag team division has kind of disappeared. And everything they've done with the guns has not been anything that you could take seriously. The family mediation with the fake therapist. And then this stuff. It's making them look bad. And I don't think it's... Uh, I worry about... You know, AEW has a has a track record of doing a bad job of managing people that are over. The acclaimed were one of the exceptions because they got themselves over. Let's see how they manage it now because it's not looking good. To me. I guess there are fans that like that style of uh, angle and comedy. Well, for the kind of people that like that kind of thing, that's the kind of thing those people like. But um, I remember when Wardlow got himself over and went right into a feud with a fake law lawyer and 25 security guards. All righty then, the next match, our boy Take. You couldn't say it either. Takeshita. I've had some I've had some nice things to say about him. That will now come to an end because now somebody did. They sent me the clip out. He had a match with Riho. Was hey, it actually oh. with Riho? Riho. Yes, it was. It's like I told you, every single person in the business now does stupid stuff before they get onto the main stage. It's sad. Well, so anyway, I'll acknowledge that uh, he's the best one that they've found from the Japanese outlaw garbage wrestling scene, but I can't honestly pull for him and get behind him now because he's the same as the fucking rest of them. It was, it was bad embarrassing, too, because it was one of the ones where they don't even try to make it plausible like they do here in this country. They just... Show us you could do work. the moves. Yeah, they just the work moves. like they're same size and even, and everything's okay. Is it recent? Anyway, huh? Is it recent? I don't know. I mean, how it has to be. What can this guy be? Twenty five years old. He was a grown person when he was doing it. So within the last five years. Well, how old's Rio? She's got like thirty years in the business now. Well, she she started the at the size. age of like she, two. She could have been an embryo. She's the same size she is now. She went on a diet. She wanted to lose five pounds, so she did from 99 to 94, and now she's looking to get down to her original weight, six pounds, three ounces. Anyway, um, I did write, this was I watched this before I had seen the take Rio match. Uh, I said, he looks great. Will he finally win a match? Because they've beaten him in every instant, but I thought, okay, it's Cage, who means nothing. So this chance to get takeover. Question is, will Cage have such a shitty match with him that it hurts old take to beat a guy like that? He was shining at the start, and then Cage just picked him up and buckle-bombed him into the ring post and started the heat within about a minute. But then within 30 seconds or so, old take was coming back and hit a blue thunder bomb for a two-count, but then missed a knee and took a nice bump over the top. But then he jumped right back up so that Cage could suplex him outside in and not cover him. So I realized there's going to be no heat spot, no cutoff, no set of heat, no specific comeback because Cage is ev evidently leading this and none of his shit makes any sense. So they did moves to each other. When they came back from the break, uh, take... Uh, it was, hits a missile drop kick for the first move of his comeback, and both of them sell that. He never covered the guy then. Then Cage gives old Take a head palm shoot off. I swear to God. He grabs this grown adult man that is taller than he is, does Brian Cage, with his right hand by the back of the guy's head. Actually, grab is too strong a word. He puts his hand on the back of the guy's head and and just goes whoosh and flings him, apparently, into the ropes. But when he does that, Cage, he staggers around 360 degrees in a circle because that, <laughs> that effort took so much out of him where he waved his arm and a 200-something-pound man flew away. 
that he turns in a circle and when take a shit comes off the ropes, he just clotheslines Cage, who turned in a circle for no fucking reason in the middle of the ring. Jump down, turn around, pick a bale of cotton. So hey, when I saw that, I said, fuck it, I'm skipping to the finish because this is garbage. Apparently, they did a number of big moves and then take a shit, gave him a superplex and a knee lift, one, two, three. But uh, again, I, I'm embarrassed every time you say, boy, if somebody could just take a picture of Brian Cage standing there, he looks incredible. Don't let him move. Don't let him breathe. What do you think, Brian? Why is he all over the show again? Well, because the, they've cycled out shitty wrestlers and cycled in some more shitty wrestlers. Wasn't crazy about this match. If you've seen one Brian Cage match, you've seen them all. Takeshita has a lot of uh, potential, but he's working with Brian Cage here, and I don't think the... I didn't care about it, and I'm not sure how much the viewers did either. What happened to Hobbs? He has a book now, and um, he's been telling a story on random shows that you have to find. Because it was on I mean, Dynamite, he had, he it was on Dynamite for a book. few weeks He's in a row. And now, a booker? He was on Dynamite for a few weeks in a row, and now he hasn't been on Dynamite. I don't know if he's on Rampage. <sighs> All right. So, Rene Moxley-Good was in the back with Jericho and his Stooges, and so this is the... They've challenged Ricky Starks. Starks wants Jericho, and to get Jericho... He has to run the Garcia Guevara gauntlet, which basically means he's got to beat each member of the Jericho appreciators one at a time to get to Jericho. Not only have they done this before, but is this not what they're actually doing right fucking now with Brian Danielson? They've done this multiple times with every MJF feud, pretty much. They've done this with other guys, and now they're doing it here. And remember what we just said on the other show. Action Andretti or Starks, whoever it is, they're feuding with Jericho. These other five guys are there just so they can lose on the route to Jericho. It's ridiculous. Because none of them are feuding with anyone. None of them are doing anything. Bad booking. Mm. Well, and now you, you mentioned, uh, we've, or I mentioned, that they've cycled out some shitty wrestlers. They were only on pre-tape uh, here on this program, we had Olivier and the Buckaroos and Don Fallis and Michael Naka Knock It to Fuck Off in a pre-tape on the basketball court somewhere in the building, I guess. And within a few seconds, in walks Matt Hardy and Stokely and the other page and Cassidy, and the challenge is made for a six-man tag team match Friday on Rampage. Thankfully, we don't have to watch that. But nobody, again, was serious here in any way. They weren't funny. They weren't doing funny comedy. They were just jacking off so you could tell it wasn't important, and they weren't serious about it. So isn't that kind of like even worse than being funny and actually being funny about wanting to fight, but at least it's funny when it's not funny? You're just being jack-offs, and everybody knows it's phony? The Bucks like can't you. do serious. They can only do their brand of bad humor, and it's not good. It's never good. The promos are always terrible, and it's always bad humor. It's just, the, the verbal part of this was like if this was a run-through, and they were just blocking it out for the light and the camera angle, and they'd just say whatever. <laughs> so, anyway, and then we broke our string of misery, and potentially... Well, my second favorite thing that I saw out of both programs, Wednesday and Friday, and my first favorite match, only favorite match, was Brian Danielson and Timothy Thatcher. And again, at least they're learning, because what did we see at 9 o'clock Eastern, top of the hour, Brian Danielson making his entrance, the biggest star on this particular two-hour program, so that might hook somebody. And... Obviously, the story, again, is Thatcher's another one of the guys that uh, MJF is trying to get to beat and hurt and put out of commission Brian Danielson before the pay-per-view match where he challenges MJF for the title. But again, 
from the from the bell on this one the professionalism of the work the approach the presentation was 10 levels above anything else so far on the program both these guys know what they're doing they've had the wrestling they had the striking they had the little things the timing and the pace it was an athletic contest uh thatcher is a heel but he's a wrestling heel where he doesn't it's not like the sheik he's pulling a fucking knife out of his trunks or he's carving somebody up or he's hitting you over the head with a chair he's drinking your bones or eating your blood he's a, a old fashioned wrestling heel where where he has the talent but you can tell he's also a salty old prick and i love the way he looks older than he 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 has to look older than he is he can't chronologically be as old as he looks and that's refreshing he looks like Dory Funk Jr. if Dory had great facials. The old-time wrestler's body, no knee pads, all his the way he works, the tightness of his holes and the way he goes in and out of them. And you know, again, this was a wrestling match and it they didn't have fucking furniture and they didn't have goddamn uh, you know, the out in the crowd and the goddamn multiple run-ins and all this fucking Tom foolishness. It was an athletic contest and a wrestling match that built and you could get into it. And Thatcher's the heel and Danielson's the baby face. We want to see him succeed. Thatcher goes for the double arm. Danielson fights out. Thatcher back up for the regular suplex. Danielson fights out. Danielson hits the missile drop kick but sells the shoulder that Thatcher's been working on when he lands. They traded the European uppercuts, which, again, Thatcher reminds me of Dory. Was Dory the first one doing those? Did Because was it the influence of guys like maybe Ted Heath or John Foley, those guys that worked from England that worked Texas in the 60s when Dory was breaking in? I don't know, but I've actually always hated them. Really? I've Why? never, I've never ever liked them. I always thought they looked like crap when Dory Funk Jr. did them. I've never liked anyone else doing them. Billy Robinson. Billy Robinson's looked the best, probably. Now that I'm they, thinking about they, it, they may not have felt the best. I always thought I was impressed by them because it looked like a fucking shoot, like, a, and you could hear it. If you watch wrestling with someone who's not a wrestling fan and someone does that, they have, they can't understand what just happened because they just watched it. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> I think it's the I think it's one of the worst things that people well, do in their matches. Well, I can see that, but if you but if think about this, Terry Funk threw one of the best punches in the wrestling business. Dory never threw a punch, really. Dory always hit because it was it, it, it that was something that those technical heels would do because it was a it was a legal blow in wrestling rather than a closed fist, but also because it came up out of nowhere, it was kind of a dirty thing subliminally to the people. I don't know, but anyway, they did they did them well here. It's better than the goddamn little flipper forearms that you see from all these guys now, where they just throw it to the side of your neck. And in 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 the contest at the opening between uh, Johnny Scissorhands and Hangnail, they laid those in where you could hear them a little bit. But most of the time, those guys are just pissy. Those guys. anyway. Uh, they had some wrestling exchanges. Uh, they squashed the referee in the corner, and here's the the one thing I didn't like, and you tell me what you think. They're having this match where they're going back and forth, and they're getting some two counts, and then Danielson gets the sleeper, and they squash the referee in the corner, and the ref is down, and here comes MJF down the ramp, putting the ring on. You know, oh, this is going to be easy, and suddenly, in a hoodie, comes take a shit, and tackles him down on the floor and just fights him back down the entryway and they're gone. And then they're still having the match. And Thatcher gets a Fujiwara arm bar and Danielson gets the rope break. But now the fans are flat because... And the referees back up. So I know in Tony's Adderall prescription... It says, oh, I've got to involve MJF some kind of way because that's the story. 
And I want to push old Take, and he's kind of taken up for MJF last week, or not MJF, but uh, Danielson last week. So I'll continue that. But what he did, it was an unnecessary distraction from the match. At that point, just to bump the referee, just to do that spot, neither one of them ever got in the ring, but it took all the fans in the arena's attention and a lot of the TV viewers' attention to that and down the aisleway, and then they were having a great match and they were building some shit, but now they got to fucking, in effect, start from scratch. Thatcher has the arm bar and, and Danielson gets a rope break, but they could have obviously going from, Oh my God, chaos on the floor to a submission hold. The movement is lessened. You, you, they distracted there. And then Danielson's immediately going home. He hits a German suplex and the big Bukaki knee and gets the one, two, three, and yes, the people pop because they wanted to see him win, but it was an unnecessary distraction right at the fucking finish. And I don't see why, well, hold on, and I'll I'll let you say that. I don't see why they couldn't have finished their match like they did, but have Danielson still selling the effects of what he'd been through long enough for MJF to come down and do the same thing and take a shit to fucking tackle him, and off they go, because what was going to happen next? Now, go ahead. You know, the other interesting thing about all of this, if you stop and think about it, how many ref bumps have there ever been in AEW? Well, you know what? They never do I don't do remember them. one. They never do them. Never. So they pick, of all times, they pick this to do that <laughs> instead of something meaningful to happen. Does it feel to you like the MJF Danielson feud is off somehow? I mean, they got, I know you're not a fan of him. I actually like him so far, but they're cramming Takeshita into the middle of this thing. Danielson's doing what every MJF opponent does and going through the gauntlet of people that he finds. Yeah. But I don't know. It just feels like it should just kind of be, I hate you, you hate me, let's do promos week after week, as opposed to everything else. It just feels like the feud doesn't mean as much today as it did a few weeks ago. To me, what do you think? Well, after what I saw next, nothing means as much. <laughs> the food doesn't taste as good. The sunlight isn't as bright. Because now MJF, the one guy that ought to be protected, they're in the back of the arena, him and Take, and they're having the big fight, and then a bunch of people run in and pull them apart, and there's 14 people pulling them apart, and they're yelling and screaming, and suddenly here comes Rene Moxley Good in the middle. Literally in the middle of all of them, in the middle of the two pulled apart bunches with a microphone and everybody, she gets their attention by saying, listen up. And everybody stops to listen. And she says, per Tony Khan next week, it's going to be MJF versus take a shit. But the pri it, it, I'm not, again, against the match, but the way it was done was so visually and obviously phony. And then everybody starts yelling again after they listen to her. I think they aired that early. I think that pre-tape aired earlier than it was supposed to. I, I don't know what to tell you. Are they jamming Renee Moxley good into every segment? It feels like yes. now they're trying to justify her contract because she's talking more than any other, than uh, Dasha, than Shivani. Shivani doesn't say anything. He hands the mic over and walks away. Then um, the other one, whose name I'm forgetting right now, none of them really say anything. They just hold the mic. Officer and Barb Brady. Officer Barb Brady was the worst. She, she'd she be a welcome uh, replacement for Barb Brady. But yes, she's she, because, again, she's it, not Mean Jean. I think that's the one thing no. a lot of people have to understand. She's not Mean Jean. Fans don't like her the way they like Mean Jean. Stop pretending she's a bigger personality than she is. That's the thing she did, you know, real, a real promotion interview fucking show for a while. And so they think that she's Mike Wallace. But anyway, this would just, it was a phony presentation of this, that all these people, this massive fight, and suddenly they're being pulled apart and they're going to stop and listen to the proclamation of, you know, the plumber's wife. And... Uh, Anyway, I'm sure MJF obviously will beat old take next week. Um, but 
again, this it's muddling the water somewhat. And then the next thing he saw after the break was MJF. And he seemed to have gotten himself together. Yeah. This is the one I meant they rushed. They played this one when they weren't supposed to. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. Well, e- either, either case, either this one was later, the other one was early because that's the thing. Now MJF comes in the back, like after a commercial break and his hair is combed and he doesn't seem to be flustered in any way, besides the fact that he's trying to motivate rush by giving him a briefcase full of cash to fuck up Danielson next week. And he says, there's five more of these where that came from. So for once, there's a heel doing heel things, but it was right after he just had a pull apart with the fucking rising star while he's the world champion about to face the... Okay, we're getting complicated. Yeah. Yes, we are. Roosh does Andrade better than Andrade ever did. Hey, let me ask you this. What do you do with Thatcher? Do you bring him back? Do you sign him? Is this someone that you think you should have on the roster? I can't imagine why they wouldn't sign this guy with all these other indie riffic fucking sensations that this is from the company that once had Marco stunt under contract. If they've got a chance to give Timothy Thatcher a job, I would suggest highly they do it. He might be able to teach some other people something around there. Anyway, speaking of teaching people things, the next match was red velvet versus Jane Cargill. And you know what they taught me how to do? Get up and take a piss. Any of the women's segments that you're going to take a break during, I wouldn't do it during the Jade Cargill segments. She's the one I wouldn't skip. Well, this show was on my on my last nerve already. It didn't take a lot of their gravy to go all over my plate this week. But what did I miss here? Besides Jane's 50th win. You missed a fine match, and Jade is feuding with the former baddies. Yeah. And Red Velvet lost, and... uh Oh, so what well, now are the baddies baby faces or is Jane a baby face now? No, I think she owns the trademark, the baddies, so they don't call themselves baddies anymore. Now they're the artists formerly known as baddies. Are they rottens? <laughs> they're the rottens. But I'm asking, but which, which side are we supposed to be on? We supposed to be on the former baddies because they got tired of being treated as flunkies well, or are we supposed to be on Jane's because they, they stabbed her in the back? I think Red Velvet and Kiara Hogan are supposed to be the babyfaces because Jade acts like Jade and she's a heel. But then after Jade won, she brought her daughter in the ring. And who celebrates with their kids but a babyface? Well, that's why I was asking you that question, because she wins her 50th. She's the only person in AEW, male or female, that's undefeated. (laughs) Tony decided he's going to do an undefeated streak, and he did it with the fucking Jane Cargill. Can you imagine? If if a top name that might be in a main event of a fucking pay-per-view, but nevertheless, the heel brings her cute little daughter in the ring to celebrate her victory. So she's the the best mother heel we've ever I don't know what the fuck's going on here. Um Hey, so how many wins does she need before she gets an AEW title match? Well, here's what I'm gonna ask. I can't wait to see whether or not she gets job face whenever the time eventually comes as it has to for all of us. I think it depends Where's... on who. If, if they say you're losing to Riho, that's gonna, you're going to get boo-boo job face. <laughs> oh, I'd love to see that. But hey, Twinkle Toe's supposed to be in charge of the women's division. I'm sure that the fans are clamoring for Riho and Jane. And speaking of the women's division, uh, Britt Baker and Ruby Soho and somebody else were in the back. Jamie with- Hayter. Yeah, well, okay. There you- well, see, I just I just said somebody because I wasn't paying attention because they were referring to something that I skipped earlier in the program. Because did- can you tell besides Thatcher and Danielson, this show has gotten on my last fucking nerve. Again, I'm going to say because I've been complimenting them for several weeks for maybe two months I've said I enjoyed the program. By and large, I hated this week's episode. Even with the Danielson match, I didn't like this episode at all. Well, and be careful what you wish for, because sometimes you get it. I said, oh my God, Samoa Joe, push Samoa Joe. I've uh, Since I was with Samoa Joe and TNA, I was a fan of his. I thought that, it, besides the fact that he and Angle actually produced business numbers for TNA... I loved his work and he was 
either diminished or cast as not cast aside, but he was diminished or whatever it, because of the hierarchy there where all the ex WWE guys that came down for a paid vacation needed to take precedent. And I always enjoyed his work in ring of honor, except I was afraid at one point, remember I said this years ago that if ring of honor had got Joe after the way that Joe had been used most recently, I don't know whether it'd be great because of the booking that they had fucking just, you know, but anyway, I've been screaming for 15 years for somebody to book Samoa Joe on top. And now here, at least he has the, he had the TNT title and he has the ring of honor TV title. And unlike anybody else that I can think of that they have brought into AEW in the past, I don't know how long, they did beat him a couple times, and they did marginalize him a bit, but they started fairly quickly giving him actual wins on television and giving him time to talk, and his promos have been excellent. The delivery, the voice he has, the inflection, the he's not only intelligent, but he's articulate, and he comes up with good shit. The king of television, and the way that he speaks as a heel with disdain, Plus, he's more motivated. You can tell one thing you could tell when when Joe was motivated because he he moves better and he's 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 himself more in his matches. When he's doing bullshit booking or he's being, you know, misused, you can tell that sometimes he's like, ah, but he he's up for this. His work is great because he has that unique style where that big body works for him and he can do all that shit. And he's got the fucking badass demeanor. He's got everything. When in a, a business that's short of all of those attributes on almost anybody, he's got all of them. But then, as we mentioned, they just started something that would pay dividends if it ran for three months, four months, six months. Guy with both TV titles, the king of television, going out and imposing his fucking will on people and pushing them around and cutting those promos and being a badass. You can see that Samoa Joe done right presented in that fashion for an extended concerted push. You can see Joe versus Moxley being a pay-per-view money match for this company because you could put Moxley in fucking jeopardy with that big badass. Samoa Joe and Brian Danielson being a pay-per-view money match for that company. I won't even talk about Samoa Joe and CM Punk that drew money for Ring of Honor when nobody hardly even knew it was a thing yet. You could use the catalog for that one and actually build it up. You could use the catalog and fucking build that match, but they've, they've screwed that pooch already to begin with. But the point I'm making is you've got a guy here that has the size and the menace and the promo ability and the experience and the work and ability to be a main event heel. And you're starting to push him on television. And by the time he's the king of TV for what, six weeks. And he's just, he's beaten Wardlow and, and fucking crippled him with a lead pipe to the knee and then cut his hair off. And then a week later, they beat him with a 150 pound skateboarder, 150 pound unwell adjusted socially skateboarder but he's tough and they want to hold on that's what they did and then for the past month dar we haven't seen wardlow of course now we've heard he's had an injury well nobody needed to fucking know that he steve austin was hurt for about six months one time general public didn't know because we kept him on tv but the point is you didn't have to just re-rack everything wardlow got prison raped on an episode of their program by a fucking vicious heel, and seven days later, a diminutive middle schooler with a fucking maladjusted goddamn social complex kicked his ass and beat him right in the middle of the ring just because it was his hometown. So then that left Wardlow with his dick in his hand, and you derailed the king of television push that even though now apparently it's being reinstated, you've left a blemish on. That means Samoa Joe did not have a an unobstructed trajectory to try to get to the top. He, unfortunately, 
had the fucking problems that everybody else has had with Tony's bookings that he can't leave anything alone. And he wanted to give Darby a present, apparently, in his hometown. So now Darby defends the title every week for the last few weeks and then gets a rematch with Samoa Joe and somewhere in, I hate to give spoilers, but Joe's going to win the title back here because somehow in Tony's demented mind, he thinks that that just erases the last month and the fucking hole in everything and brings us back to where we were before Samoa Joe got beat by an amoeba. So... In this match, by the way, now that I've spoiled the finish, don't worry, there's more to come. The stipulation for the TNT title was it was no holds barred. I don't know what the fuck they could possibly do in this that they didn't do in the match between Page and Hangnail, or Page and Hangnail, Page and Plummer in the first two segments of this show, but this one, since that wasn't no holds barred, but have any holes ever been barred from any of their other matches between Joe and Darby? I remember furniture and skateboards and chairs. So Darby comes down the aisleway and takes off his jacket and has a thumbtack hoodie on. A hoodie that is studded like, remember the, the old fucking TV commercials for the bedazzler? You could put rhinestones on anything. Well, he's be tacked his fucking hoodie. I know that he appeals to a segment of young people and those young people are usually fucking stupid too. But I, I, I try to like Darby and he, and, and he drives me away. He's a fucking moron and people who like that shit are morons. You idiot. You're going to wear fucking thumbtacks apparel. At least the road warrior spikes would only impale other people, not themselves. So immediately he's hammering Joe with the thumbtack jacket on and Joe uses a towel around his neck to wrap it around his arm and give Darby a clothesline and stop him. That was actually very resourceful. But now Joe is already bleeding from the back and the arms because of the fucking tacks. And hold on, there's more. If Joe kicks the shit out of Darby. He pulls out a table one minute in. But Darby dives out onto, hits the table and knocks the table into Joe and the cameraman too, and they put a fucking floor cameraman on his ass. And then Joe throws Darby into and over the steel stairs and the railing and out in the arena. It's just, they're up the stairs into the general admission seats. Why? The second match tonight, but then, now they're all the way up in the, and they just... They fight, in quotation marks, and I love Samoa Joe, and he's talented. He, he needs better than this. They fight, in quotation marks, up the stairs, the concrete stairs, in the general admission seats of the arena. And it's not, it's, it's like they're walking up the stairs and swinging at each other, or Joe will chuck Darby a few feet and continue. And finally, at one point, he just picked Darby up and dumped him head first over the little railing onto the concrete stairs. But now Joe, by this point, was bleeding from the head hard way, not something that was planned or he did on purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, as a trained observer, I can testify to this. So now, Samoa Joe is bleeding from at least three different places on his body while he's beating the shit out of Darby Allen, it is injuring Samoa Joe <laughs> to beat up Darby Allen. And they go through the break. And, and during the break, they actually came back down and got in the ring. And they come back in the ring, and, and Joe is still beating the shit out. Of, and that's why I said, my God, he's done nothing but beat the shit out of this guy, and he's the one bleeding from everywhere. And so Joe gets a sleeper. And then Darby Allen just gets up to his feet. He's 145 fucking pounds and his 300 and something pounds Samoan is on, on his back with a fucking sleeper after all this other shit. And he just stands up and backs Joe into the corner, breaks the sleeper and starts wailing on him. And Joe shuts him down again and he kicks out again. And did you say... Joe's been doing this for 15 years. The guy runs at him in the corner and Joe catches him 
that kind of rock bottom out of the corner, right? So sock face, and it looks stiff. He delivers it with some force. Sock face on commentary made sure to call that by its Japanese name, the Space Tornado Ogawa, and makes mention that comes from Joe's tours of Japan. Like, yeah, that's where Joe stole it. So he's got a goddamn main event level talent on his own television program right here in the good old United States of America. Instead of saying, my God, look at the strength and power of Samoa Joe in the innovative way, he just caught Darby Allen in midair and slammed him to the mat with that incredible whiplashing force. It's like, no, he stole that from some Japanese clown that I'm a mark for and that you people have never heard of, and he's a plagiarist. If speaking to the narrowest nerd audience, by the way, Excalibur, from me to you, I haven't said this for a while, you're the fucking shits. So anyway, then <laughs> Joe pulls out another table and leans it up on the railing halfway out in the audience, so I'm... <laughs> I was waiting for a teeter-totter spot that would take the front row's teeth out. He gets in the ring, and Darby starts a comeback, and Joe just grabs him and beals him over the top rope to the floor, and Darby got his feet under him as he was spinning rapidly. We should have broke both his legs. And then Joe pulls three chairs out of from under the ring and throws them in and sets them up like he's in shop class in the ring with this the spines or the backs of the chair, chairs pointing toward each other. And then he drops Darby Allen's spine first on the chair backs. In the middle, while I, and again, the referee is standing dumbfounded. Yes, it's no holds barred, lazy booking. But he... The, and Brian... If a wrestling match has been agreed that there's no disqualification, and the referee knows he's not allowed to disqualify anybody. Does that mean if one of these guys pulled out from under the ring a shotgun case and pulled a shotgun out and was going to shoot the other guy in the head that the referee was not allowed to make an effort to take the gun away? It's my favorite Jesse Ventura argument. Rick Rude vs. Ultimate Warrior, SummerSlam 89. Rude gets hit with the bell by the Warrior. And Jesse Ventura's like, that's a disqualification! Why is the referee disqualifying him? And Shivani says, well, they're on the floor, Jess. And he goes, so? Can he shoot him? Can he get a gun and just shoot him? <laughs> <laughs> but that was it. The referee has to stand there and, and leave the chairs alone while Joe goes and picks the guy up and does that instead of doing anything. to. So it's just so phony. And then Joe sets the chairs up facing each other different way this time so he can power bomb Darby on him. And when he picks Darby up for the power bomb, Darby Allen throws powder in Joe's eyes and then jumps up and code reds him. You know, that leaping sunset flip flippy thingy. Cause he's a hundred percent. Darby Allen is less than 30 seconds after a broken spine and got a two count for the code red. And then he gave Joe a flipping stunner where, again, he's he's been demolished for 20 minutes. Everything possible that's been done can be done to a human body has been done to this fucking guy by a guy twice the size of him. And now he's doing flips over the top of Joe and doing a flipping stunner. And then he grabs his tack jacket. And he tries to put the tack jacket back on, but since the they're actual tacks, it's all stuck in a fucking wad. It looks like he's trying to put on a fucking large tack-filled wad of chewing gum. So he just has his head stuck through the hole and he does a coffin drop with the tack jacket on onto Joe right on top of him with all of his fucking weight. Two count. And then Darby goes, uh, this is this is where I said, all right, motherfuckers, I'm fucking, it, 
If I didn't think so much of Joe as a as a professional and a person, I'd be done with Samoa Joe just for not getting up and coming over and just sticking his fucking clown's head up his own ass. After that, Darby Allen, who's been fucking demolished the whole match and had his back broken and his fucking legs nearly broken and goddamn whatever the fuck. He's so tough. Samoa Joe, who has taken a code red and a stunner and a coffin drop has to roll to the floor so he doesn't have to lay in the ring and be embarrassed where everybody can see him. He's got to roll to the floor and stay on the floor out of camera view while Darby Allen goes under the ring and pulls out a box cutter and pulls off the apron skirt and starts cutting the canvas ties. Because that, for the people not familiar, the canvas, the mat over the ring area has fucking grommets in it about every foot and a rope goes through it and it is tied a, a continuous looping pattern is tied to the fucking bottom of the goddamn ring. That's what keeps the canvas tight. So Darby is going to cut the canvas loose so that he can expose the bare boards of the wrestling ring. You fucking moron. And I can't believe anybody walked through this or they just took his word for it that he could do it. He starts cutting those ties and he goes all the way down one side of the ring and then back because there's a bunch of them. And then he's got to cut goddamn another side and then he's trying to get the canvas up and then he's pulling the padding out from under the canvas to expose the boards. Brian, do you know how long by actual timing that this took? I don't know. It felt like it took a very long time. It was a long time that Samoa Joe vanished and it took forever for Darby to cut all the way around the ring. One minute and 40 seconds from the time he started till the time he finished. And where was Joe? Rolled out on the floor in plain view of everybody in the building trying to figure out something to sell or just hiding there in embarrassment that he had to be a part of this fucking fiasco. And so then, after they had... They'd already had a garbage match to begin with, and it was already ridiculous to begin with, and then they killed the flow of that. So Darby cut the canvas ties, pulled the pads out, turned the canvas back, and then Joe's out on the floor. Now he can stand up because all of this has been done as he stands up in front of the table that they had leaned up against the railing earlier in the match Darby runs and dives out head first through the fucking ropes and hangs his goddamn feet on the top rope. Now, Joe was going to do the spot where Joe walked away anyway. Joe likes to walk away from dives because it is a pop that every other stupid dumb fuck stands there. So it was the spot he was going to walk away anyway, but Darby then fucking went. He didn't go into the table. He went beside the table, broke the table with what looked like his legs and landed upside down head first on the goddamn floor. And at that point, Stacy had come in and I said, watch this, because we were already a minute into the fucking zip tie cutting. And I said, watch this, watch this. And I backed it up for her. And she said, what a waste of fucking time that when she saw this guy spent almost two minutes doing nothing but destroying the ring and then gets in and runs across and dives out and lands on his fucking head for his own clumsiness. She said, you see this in armories, not national television. And they can't get out of this mindset that they have to have this garbage and this fucking foolishness. So anyway... <laughs> The fucking guy lands on his head on the floor. Then Joe throws him in the ring and hits a power bomb on the fucking tack jacket. And then Darby's up again, wailing away at Joe with a fucking chair and goes to the top 
And Joe gives him, basically catches him and gives him the muscle buster off the top rope onto the ring boards. One, two, three. So now they've put in people's minds that, well, okay, they've got all that padding. And without it, boy, that, that really must be hard. But at the same time, this big giant Samoan just dropped this fucking little skateboarder head first on this. And he's going to walk next week. We'll see him again. So it can't be too bad. What the fuck are they doing? Now they're, now they've, everybody else who takes bumps in a regular ring. Oh, well, they got it easy. There's pads on there, but boy, Darby. If only everybody was a diminutive, microscopic, 145-pound, maladjusted skateboarder. Why, they'd be invincible. And then Wardlow hit the ring and (laughs) speared Joe and started wailing away on him, and Joe rolled out and fucking ran off. So Joe got juice from the head and the body for a guy half his size it's obviously a fucking moron and took everything that he could do to fucking beat this guy and to beat him finally had to modify the ring to be able to put this guy down. So why should I ever buy Joe against Moxley or against Danielson or against Punk or against MJF at some point that could be an incredible promo battle and the chance for people to say, well, shit, of anybody that MJF's ever faced, this motherfucker's as dirty and dastardly as he is, and the people would be behind Joe. But no, because he can't beat a fucking guy from a playground. (sighs) And Wardlow... And that's what we're going to get next, more Samoa Joe and Wardlow. And Wardlow got to run Joe off after Joe had done everything he could to beat a fucking guy half the size of Wardlow. I can't wait to see that match. God damn it. You know what? Hold on here. That's where Tony Khan's head is at. I saw this and I said... Can I tell you what I would do? It's not what you would do, but I would obviously do a lot of things differently here. But I would capture the moment and kind of run with it. And again, the booking in AEW kills everyone eventually. Fuck Wardlow and Samoa Joe. We want them to do something, do something without the belt. Have Joe come out there, drop that TV belt to Mark Briscoe. And let's move on with the TV belt in a different direction. Mark Briscoe, not even mentioned on this show, was... The star, obviously, of last week's show, not a mention of him, nothing here. We always talk about how they don't really do a good job going from week to week. That's just a small example, and that's just a small idea, because I am not well, he, he No, he was mentioned, because several times they did mention the tribute show to JB. He was mentioned, but why... Why wasn't why, he on the show? Why wasn't he mentioned in a, a... Mark Briscoe is all elite. We have signed this guy. And I agree with your sentiment. I wouldn't put the Ring of Honor TV title on him. I'd make him the Ring of Honor world champion. And I would, I would do Who is the ring? That's quicker Claudio. than sooner. Claudio's the ring. I was actually talking about the AEW TV champion, but Claudio's no, still the I world would, champion, right? I, I would, I, here's what I would do is I would bring Mark in and as part of a multifaceted push for him, I'd make him the ring of honor world champion. Because who else would, if you're going to make anything out of ring of honor and that's yet to be determined, we've heard talk then who else could carry the standard and the, the banner for Ring of Honor than the guy that's most synonymous with it, him and, and in memory of his brother that were the two guys that were there since day one? And that get, would that's at least give Mark something to hang his hat on and also establish that he's going to be a single and he's not going to be working in other people's shadows anymore. But that... Might require too much fucking effort. I did not like this episode of AEW. Do you want to talk about the ratings? Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. I understand a bunch of other people didn't like this episode of of, uh, AEW either. What were the ratings? The overall number, 901,000. 
So down about a hundred thousand from last week that, uh, that also had the incredible pattern, as we said, it was better for them from start to finish because they waited till the end to see the Briscoe tribute, correct? Last week. That is correct. They stayed all the way to the end, bucking the trend. We'll see what happens this week. Of course, traditionally, the women's match in around 930 drives off a lot of people and they don't come back. Let's see what happens. Segment one. By the way, this is uh, the chart I'm looking at was done by Brandon Thurston at WrestleNomics. Segment 1, 8 to 8.15 p.m., Moxley versus Hangman Page, including picture-in-picture, 1,065,000 viewers. And they were, uh, they were at 1.2 at a start last, last week, so that's down as well. And maybe their lead-in was down. So let's see where it goes from here. Segment 2, which is the last four minutes of Moxley versus Page, as well as the post-match angle, and Darby Allen's video, 1,015,000 viewers. So they kept them, pre- only lost 50,000 for that backwards match. Uh, that's not bad. Segment three, including the Jamie Hayter, Bunny, Soraya, Tony Storm, and Britt Baker backstage angle. Yeah, that's what I skipped. And the acclaimed having a match and then a confrontation with the Gunn family. Also, Jack Perry's live promo. And the beginning of Brian Cage versus Takeshita, 995,000 viewers. Okay, well then they've only lost another 20,000, so they're actually the 65, 70,000 viewers from start to end of quarter three. That, that That's much better than normal. Segment four, maybe the problem with putting people that fans really like, the most hardcore fans, but the other people don't really know yet on your show. Segment 4, 8.45 to 9 p.m. The continuation of Cage versus Takeshita, including including Picture in Picture, as well as the Jericho Appreciation Society promo backstage, and the big angle with the Elite and the Firm, 849,000 viewers. Oh my god, so that is... 146,000 people decided the same thing that I decided, that Brian Cage can't fucking wrestle. It was Cage versus Takeshita, who, again, AEW fans really like, and I've thought he's really good, but to the average person, they don't know him, and he's wrestling against someone they've proven they don't care about, and then after that, the Jericho Clowns, and then the Elite and the Firm? There's your answer. But let's go to segment five, nine to nine fifteen. Brian Danielson versus Timothy Thatcher, including picture in picture, 853,000 viewers. Well, they kept what they had and got 4,000 back, but that's, again, you know, do they have a bigger star than Brian Danielson that they could put at the top of the nine o'clock hour to keep people's attention? No, not really. <sighs> well, 9.15 to 9.30. It's a, it's a pity they missed a good match. Segment 6, 9.15 to 9.30, which is the finish of that match, as well as the angle afterwards with MJF. Oh, I missed this. Dustin Rhodes and Swerve Strickland's video. And then MJF and Rush, or Roosh, having a backstage angle. And then the beginning of Jade versus Red Velvet. Oh, boy. With picture in picture. 815,000 viewers. Ooh. Okay, so all of that fall to raw lost 38,000 more people. Segment 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. The final four minutes of Cargill versus Red Velvet and the post-match. And then Britt Baker, Jamie Hayter, and Ruby Soho's backstage promo. And the beginning of Darby versus Samoa Joe. 783,000 viewers. Oh, Christ on a cracker. That's another 32,000 people. So they are now down 280,000 people from the start of the program. And finally, segment eight, 9.45 to 10 p.m., Darby Allen versus Samoa Joe with picture-in-picture, 830,000 viewers. So they actually brought another 47,000 back to see. And I was actually going to say maybe it was a, a better thing for him if nobody saw that match. Better for Joe. Nobody saw him struggle like that to land that fish. But The 830... 
to 845 segment from that to 845 to 9, going from 995,000 viewers to 849,000 viewers. I don't know if there's been a drastic drop like that lately. That was sharp. Um, and again, they they finish up at one point, as I said, they were down 280,000. They finish up at, what, 200 and... No, wait a minute. They were almost down, almost, yeah, 280,000, and they finish up 200 and... What is that goddamn math in my head? 235,000 below where they started. Hmm. That's... 25% almost. So, we, we, and we we did this on, uh, what was the, uh, the drive through is your show. We did it where we talked about the raw numbers. They lost people in, in hour three, especially because it's attrition and fighting sleep at that point, but they still don't lose that big a percentage. They have bigger audience swings because the overall aggregate audience is bigger, but this is they just can't get people to stick with this program, no matter what they put on last, unless it was last week, and it's a tribute to somebody that everybody was interested in seeing. So, unless it's something people are actually clamoring to see. With all due respect, did anyone want to see another Samoa Joe Darby Allen match? I was kind of looking forward to this episode because of the Moxley Page thing they've been building up. That match let me down. Danielson versus Thatcher. I didn't like it as much as everyone else. This was the one match we've seen a few times. Darby didn't show himself as TV champion as someone who's going to get people to tune back in at the end of the show. Remember, they tried him at the end of the show for several weeks. Right. Got no star power. Whatever you want to say about Moxley, like you and I have said, we don't get it. He at least gets a little bit of a number. Jericho's not pulling any numbers. Danielson's not pulling any numbers. Maybe if you put stars against stars, it'll do something. But for everyone that says Tony should try to do something with CM Punk, here's the biggest argument. Not even that he's still the biggest merch mover or anything else. You need stars, and where are you going to get any? Somebody needs to hit him in the head so he can see some. He can see stars, but can he hear stars? Well, that's the question, and I'll tell you what you need to hear, folks. You need to hear what you want to hear. You need to hear what you like and what you want to hear and what you want to tune into, because that way you're going to be in your own little cocoon, and you're not going to have to worry and stress and fret about the outside world. Whether you want to listen to podcasts, whether you want to listen to music, whether you want to listen to, I don't know, political propaganda, whatever the case may be, the everyday earbuds from Raycon have you covered. And right now, Raycon is offering those wonderful everyday earbuds, premium audio at the perfect price point, that's what they call it, and, and they also have, have you heard about this? Have you read about this, Brian? Low-latency gaming headphones. I'm just sick it's, of dealing with the latency issues when gaming, and uh, this makes perfect sense for me. Well, I always knew that, uh, the, do you have to leave a lot of fingerprints when you game? Leave a I lot guess of fingerprints? You, yeah, the latent fingerprint section. I've always heard about them in the uh, criminal uh, documentaries that I watch. They they pull those latent fingerprints. So now the you're pulling these fingerprints off the games or off the headphones? Well, why would it be off the games? Wouldn't it be off the controller? You don't play the game. You put the game into the system if you well, still actually have a physical unit. Controller is part of the game. Nevertheless, they've got the earbuds. They got the low latency gaming headphones. They got a speaker with a battery that'll last all night. They got all this stuff. They're the kings of audio. And right now, if you go to buyraycon.com, that's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N, raycon.com, you can see all this stuff. And of course, the premier, premier product we've been talking about for so long, the everyday earbuds, the ones that look great, sound great, feel great. And as a matter of fact, now they have the not only the three customizable sound profiles, so you can jack up the bass or the treble or the whatever. They've got the earbud tap functions, the noise isolation, the awareness mode. But now they've got a buy now and pay later option. So you can buy them now, but not have to pay for them till later. And you can even listen before you pay. But if you don't plan to pay, sooner or later, you're going to have to pay the piper. And we've talked about the customized gel tips for the perfect, comfortable in-ear fit. You've told me that 
They're not, that gel is not meant to be consumed by humans. So I stopped making, you know, uh, jello, uh, jello bombs out of it in the, in the refrigerator. Although the strawberry gel tips were my favorite until you told me to stop eating. Will you them. stop it? Don't even encourage people or fool people with that. Do not consume the gel tips, ladies and gentlemen. I don't think we should have to say this again. So before you eat the earbud, take the gel tip off. Just don't eat, eat the, the earbud. Put the earbud in your ear where it could be your ears bud. Well, it, and it, it'll be your ears, but it'll be your ears lifelong friend. You get eight hours of playtime on the everyday earbuds. You get 11 hours of playtime on the everyday speaker. You know why they call it the everyday speaker? Because you need to listen to it every fucking day. That's right. Get up in the morning and get it over with because it's going to call you. If you go to bed without listening to that speaker, it'll come on in the middle of the night and it'll say, come over here. Listen to me. I'm an everyday speaker. You didn't listen to me today. They're water and sweat resistant, too. Were you aware of that, Brian? I was aware of that. So you can just jump right in the pond or the pool or the tub or the whatever. Pond? Who jumps in the pond? A lot of people jump in the pond. You've never gone swimming down over at Miller's Pond? You don't stick your head under the water. How are you criticizing what I do at Miller's Pond? Other people, other people would swim in ponds. I didn't like swimming ponds, not because I didn't want to stick my head underwater, but because I never wade barefoot into a pond. I don't know why this made me think of it. Do you support throwing change into a well or a uh, body of water or making a wish? Well, yes, that's an old tradition. Okay. I especially support that if it's one that I can get access to after hours and clean it out at the bottom. But I'll guarantee goddamn you I will never walk into a body of water that I cannot see the bottom of uh, barefoot. So I've I never I've swum in lakes and ponds and even in the ocean, but I've never go in barefoot where I can't see the bottom. Just so you know. And you should not do that either, but don't put the Raycon wireless air everyday earbuds or the everyday speaker. Don't put either one of them on your feet and, and wade in to water that you can't see the bottom because they can't protect you. Even if you might think they can, but they can't. But if you do put the earbuds or the everyday speaker into your ears. Well, it's hard to put the everyday speaker into your ear. It's a little big for that, unless you got big ears. But if you stick any of them in any of your orifices and jump in underwater, they're waterproof. So that means you won't drown either. They will it save you from mean, drowning. It doesn't mean that. Don't jump into a body of water if you don't know how to swim. Well, if the earbuds are waterproof, that means they're still going to... That means they'll survive. Still, they're still going to work. Well, if you can still hear what they're saying or what they're playing, that means you're alive. So as long as you're hearing that, you can't die. So if you're <laughs> underwater, you're safe. You're not going to drown no. as long as you're wearing your earbuds. No, that is wrong. You can, in fact, die and drown. And the only part that is correct is the Raycon earbuds would still be playing. But you'd be well, dead boy, and not hearing anything. I tell you what, when they drag your bloated fucking carcass out three days later, it's still going to sound lovely. But right now, folks, go to buyraycon.com. I said that's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N.com slash J-C-E right now before they hear this spot and cut this offer off. And you're going to get 15% off your Raycon order. Anything, the, the buds, the speakers, the buds, the stems, the leaves, anything, whatever they got on the site. If they sell it, you'll get 15% off of it at buyraycon.com slash J-C-E. That's what exactly you ought to do. And speaking of doing things, Brian, while we're on a roll here, what the fuck's going on over at the wrestling news section of Arcadian Vanguard this fine week? That's right, Jim. Another Action Pack Week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. Of course, we want to remind you about The Wrestling News, your free daily wrestling newscast every morning coming at you with all the news, none of the opinion. Check it out today. TheWrestlingNews.com to download direct or look for Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Once again, every morning, get your free wrestling news from The Wrestling News. I've, I've heard it's, it's gratis. It's gratis. You, 
You pay nothing. Like so many of those CDs that I sent so many people throughout the years. <laughs> but it's gratis, that's right. Also want to remind everyone about Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon. This week coming up, his guest on the show will be Keith Elliott Greenberg to discuss the life and legacy of Lanny Poffo. Check that out, suawpod.com. Or look for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. Well, thank pitiful, you just pitiful. It sounded so much better when we did the previous take, but we couldn't use that one. But we, we can use this one, and you can go through the archive today at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The 605 Super Podcast. The Mothership! Oh, God damn it. Oh, that one hurt. Oh. <sighs> That's my vocal cords. Well, you'll be useless for the rest of the program, keeping in line with the, re the three hours and whatever we've just done. All right. No, hey. seriously, now. We got to talk about jolly old St. Nick as... Uh, as MJF has termed him, well, you over at Ar Arcadian Vanguard, you have enlisted the Merchant Bank of Teterboro to help you engage in exploring strategic alternatives. And they say that it could take up to six months to sell Arcadian Vanguard to either Disney or NBC Universal, what a Comcast, whatever. But now Nick Khan, and this is what got the headlines, but something else has been glossed over we'll talk about in a second. Nick Khan said, oh, 90 days, we can wrap this thing up. Six billion or so, seven billion maybe, whatever the case. We'll, we'll have it wrapped up. He was on CNBC with, with your guy, your guy, Farber. David Faber, I mean, my guy, we're both reasonable and Jewish. I mean, that's <laughs> what we're going to think of. No, you're a fan. He's, he's you're a fan of of Farber's. I'm you're a fan a Farber of his fanatic. and Morgan Brennan, the beautiful Morgan Brennan, of course. Don't forget her. Well, yes, but you have a soft spot in your heart for Farber because he gives good advice. And Faber, basically, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, basically, Nick Khan's on there, and uh, as I mentioned, you know, he gave the 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 all three months we should have this taken care of line that everybody was talking about, but as he's Mentioning the potential sales, old Farber comes in when he says, and you know, Comcast, whatever. Well, and Farber says, unfortunately, I hear that's not going to happen. This is CNBC. This is Farber. Faber, call him his their, name. Is there top... Why do you have to give him a gimmick name? You're never going to talk about him ever again on the show. I know, I like him now because he exposed. Nick Khan's business in front of God and everybody. Uh, he said, I, I hear that's not going to happen now. And he is their top business analyst. <laughs> he talks to all these people, right? You know yeah. better than I do. You're the one who was peeping me to who Farber was. If you watch these shows in the morning on CNBC and he's on for a few hours, he's on, uh, I think, the 9 o'clock hour and the 10 o'clock hour, which are two different shows, you hear the host talk about the CEOs that they've talked with, they went out to lunch with, they had dinner with, they had phone calls with, let alone the CEO of Comcast who owns CNBC. Who do you think he's getting the info from? It's someone at the top of Comcast. That's why he had a smile on his face when he's like, what? well, that's not that's... what I hear. <laughs> well, and speaking of a smile on, on somebody's face, as soon as he said that, they had the three shot of all of them, and as soon as he said that, Nick Khan's face froze in the kind of semi-grin that he had when the words were uttered. And he, he didn't move and he didn't change the expression as the conversation was continuing. But you could tell behind his eyes, he was like, oh, my God, yes. what did he just say? We can't let that get yeah. out. We have a very robust plan to pretend that Comcast is still in the running to purchase and this incredible, robust what? library of content that's just robust and... Very, very valuable right now. It, it's busty. No, he, he, he waited a second and he answered briefly the question of the follow-up that uh, they had talked about, but then went right back to, but, but no. I'm, I'm very bullish. I'm, I'm very bullish. Yeah, I'm then... very bullish on that. We're not as pessimistic as you think. We believe there's still, you know, some life in that proposition. And what else can he <laughs> say? But my God, here's the 
parent company's uh, network business analyst telling him on the air that they've heard he's heard that Comcast is not going to be the one to buy the company. Hey, Jim, can I have $100? No. Well, I'm very bullish on you giving me that $100. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? The guy just said, I hear they're not doing it. Well, I'm very bullish on they will do it. <laughs> well, that's because it's a lot of bull, I guess. <laughs> uh, but so... Is this the first time you've it's, seen Nick Khan? I mean, we've heard him interviewed. Is this the first time no, you've seen him I've, interviewed? I've seen, well, I've seen pictures, obviously, but I've seen a few clips. Uh, but it, it seems like he's on the the Bruce Pritchard neck machine at the gym. He's getting that open collar ah. wide neck look going on. It's a very robust neck. It's, robust it's, neck. He's like a blowfish. <laughs> it's, he's starting to grow there. Is that something that happens when they get to the top of the WWE these days? But um, I'm very bullish anyway, so, breaking through my collar. So, so we've established then, apparently, that the, it's not all sunshine, lollipops, rainbows, and waterfalls with Comcast. Who's still in the running for this besides the evil empire of Saudi Arabia, which may make the evil empire of Vince McMahon look like sunshine, lollipops, rainbows, and waterfalls? Well, the other thing in the clips you saw, because unfortunately the version that CNBC put online was clipped from the original version, which went on a little bit longer, where they were talking about potential suitors and again at the end david faber kind of you know shot up to bring up the idea that you said earlier that a deal could happen without vince mcmahon and then it became well you know if the right thing came and the value for the shareholders that's going to be the first thing because what it sounds like is what company that buys wwe is going to be willing to pay a multi-million dollar premium to get vince out of the way on top of the purchase <laughs> Does, isn't that what it sounds like isn't that what it sounds like <laughs> You got a nice company here. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. For another fifty million insurance policy, we can keep the old man away. Um, it, it, I think it sounds like that they're they're basically saying no, no, no. It wouldn't come down to. They just want out there that Vince doesn't have to still be in charge of the company. If that was the only hang up, I don't know if they've put a price tag on the amount of the extortion it would take to get him. But also he did mention Nick Khan did. And if he mentioned this, then he knows everybody's thinking it. And he knows Vince knows everybody's thinking it. He said, well, Vince is 77 years or 78, whatever. And I think, you know, he realizes that there may be other opportunity, whatever the case. So I think it now, if Vince was, even 15 years younger, I think you'd have to blow him out of the chair with dynamite, even if goddamn Putin bought the thing. But at this point, I think he might realize that it's it. And he may, Vince, too many pronouns, pal. Vince may also be able to justify at this point, well, the only reason they wouldn't want me is just they're planning for the future with this kind of investment, and I'm just too goddamn old. Because this is the guy who said... And what was it in that one of those Playboy interviews or whatever? I will die a very frustrated man because there will be so many things left to do. So he probably can justify it's not that they want him out of the way. It's that, well, he just, God damn it, he hadn't been able to come up with that fucking youth potion yet. Based on everything we've seen over the last year, all indications point to him looking for a buyer that'll keep him on board. There's nothing that says he wants to go home, that he's ready to retire. And really, when you look at why did, I didn't say when you look at creative CEOs, who goes home willingly, especially if they have complete control of the company, who goes home I willingly? I didn't say he was anxious to, but if that was the only, it seems like he's just. I think he's convinced he has to sell this thing quickly before the rights fee thing lays a fucking gobbledygooker. And then it looks like that he presided over a company that lost half of its value overnight or whatever. So, you know, because why else is he in such a rush? He already, if he just wanted to come back and take over, then he could do that because he's already done it and could do more if he wanted to. He could do it if he buys back, if he or he gets someone to buy the company and insert him in charge. 
Well, no. It, it, he can't do it while it's a public company. It would cause too much problem. He could do it this way. He can just come back and do whatever the fuck he wants to. He just did. Well, he can, but it would cause a bigger problem. I think there actually would be a stock hit if all of a sudden it was announced Vince McMahon's taking back over creative. I don't think that would be seen as a positive right now. The stock bump was from the sale. Yes. It was from the idea of a sale and Vince coming to help facilitate the sale. More than the rights fee, the sale. But if it's, I mean, you saw the concerns on CNBC. If it's Vince coming back to run creative, that's where you get concerns. That, when it's him dealing with talent. Let's not forget he just settled a rape lawsuit. Like, just settled it months ago, within the last two months. So, I well, don't think, could, I don't think he's going could, away uh, willingly. I think you're going to have to pay a premium to get him to leave. They could bring Stephanie back to run the women's division so he wouldn't have to have any contact with them. Or, or maybe, what's Linda doing these days? She's not a senator. Do you think Vince is trying to figure out who leaked everything to the Wall Street Journal? Or do you think he knows already? Boy, it would have to be such a small circle of people, wouldn't you think, that he yeah. at least strongly suspectifies who did it? Hello, Wall Street Journal. This is uh, Mr. X. I just want to say I heard a robust rumor about Vince McMahon. <laughs> I, just, this is not Nick Khan, by the way. But no, I, but I'm just, Vince is still, you know, why would they then come out and say, oh, three months or whatever the fuck? Vince wants to sell this thing now while it's worth whatever the fuck they can claim it's worth and it, but then if comcast is out and it, blah 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 what it could it could it get down to madman vince i want to give him away but linda linda won't let me you know prices slashed to the bone we're going out of business folks we've got we've got vhs's here from georgia championship wrestling right now at shop at home I mean, you know, even like some of the things you heard brought up on the CNBC clip, they brought up Endeavor, you know, who owns UFC, and they've got lots of money. They're going to take on another $6 billion in debt to purchase the WWE? I don't think so. Well, and then, you know, it's the, uh, the prevailing belief, and it may have been true 20 years ago, that UFC and wrestling have a crossover audience and you can kind of, you know, run the same kind of promotion for both. I, but now not, with the way that the wrestling business has deteriorated and or, uh, you know, osmosis uh, into something else, uh, you know, it, UFC is more now pro wrestling. They promote more like pro wrestling than pro wrestling does, but that doesn't mean that it's still it, expertise in both genres so uh, and then like you said for another six billion dollars and then they've got to either renegotiate the tv deals keep the tv deals you know make new tv deals whatever the case eh. and now you know here's something we haven't been thinking about uh we've talked about the network a lot but what's going to happen to all the stuff in the vault up there in their mountain in their cave all the AWA, all the Florida, all the, you know, the old WWWF archives, all the stuff they've bought and accumulated and were supposed to be preserving forever and digitalizing and all that stuff when, you know, whoever owns this thing it, it decides, well, who gives a shit about old Mid-Atlantic wrestling? And there you go. Yeah, you know, you and I just talked about the whole idea that we buy books you know, books that we want to read, obviously, but also books because if we want to read them in the future, we know that there's a chance it'll go out of print and disappear. With wrestling, we've seen that on a number of occasions. That's the point. If you don't have a Mid-South wrestling collection, and all of a sudden the new owner of WWE says it's too much money to put these Mid-South shows up on whatever streaming service they're on at that point, that stuff's gone to history unless you have it. Now... Is anyone going to really want to see the modern SmackDown? I don't know. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, uh, I didn't really want to, but we we did anyway. It was uh, this past Friday, February the 3rd, because it's the SmackDown after the Royal Rumble, just like the Raw after the Rumble should have some big happenings. And 
Well, it did, depending on your definition of big. SmackDown. And your definition of happenings, actually. And your definition of happening. Uh, But they were in Greenville, South Carolina. And boy, once not in the same building, obviously, the old Greenville Memorial Auditorium is gone, from what I understand. But the wrestling they have seen in that town, that's that's where Ole Anderson got stabbed. And uh, Peggy Lathan put the compress on so he didn't bleed out till the ambulance got there. In 1986, I will have you know, I remember this trivia because Sandy Scott was the local promoter. Greenville, South Carolina grossed $660,000 for Jim Crockett Promotions wrestling events. And that's almost 30 years ago, so that would make it at least a $1.5 million town in today's money. Well, how many, what year you said that was, 86? 1986. There were, I think there were 38 or 40 shows. 40 shows, what were the ticket prices? Oh, uh, in Greenville at, at that point in time, I think probably a six, six, seven dollar general admission, eight, ten ringside, something like that. You're taking inflation into the equation, but not actual ticket pricing. Oh yeah, well inflation. no, but now people think that wrestling tickets ought to be what a hundred dollars or whatever the fuck they charge now. No, this was because they ran. Uh, Greenville was a Monday night town, fifty two weeks a year, but as Crockett was expanding, because it was a B town, a secondary town compared to Charlotte, Richmond, Norfolk, Greensboro, et cetera. So they started not going every week because they just didn't have time, but it's still the, one of the secondary towns grossed almost $700,000 at tickets that were usually like eight and six, eight, ten dollars If they had the, the Great American Bash, they jacked the ticket prices up for that show there, but they also sold out. We, um, I think we did... Two all-time record gates for Greenville that summer. But nevertheless, wonderful wrestling town. And they started the show uh, with the VTR of the Bloodline demolishing Sammy at the Rumble. And, of course, you know, the uh, the story going through the whole show is that nobody's seen or heard of Jey Uso. And they pull up in the back, there's no Jey Uso. And Heyman was able to issue the longest no comment ever in the history of journalism. But anyway, we're going to get a pattern here. I'm going to go through this quickly because there's not much to talk about in most cases. They had another, the finals of the number one contender tag team tournament where the winners of this tournament will get the title match with the Usos next week. And boy, is Jay going to show up? Blah, blah, blah. But it's uh, Ricochet and his big buddy Brown Strongman against Marcel and Marceau of Imperium with Gunther. And again, and I got nothing against the Imperium guys, but it's the same thing with the Usos. They either need to be a top tag team or they need to be stooges for a top single guy. Because when they're stooges for a top single guy, you can't take them seriously as a main event tag team. And they don't use tag teams as main event talent in this company. So it's it's not like you can say that the Road Warriors and the Rock and Roll Express are on par with Dusty Rhodes and Magnum TA and the Midnight Express and Tully and Arn are on par with Flair and et cetera because it's such a, a wide difference in the way they're used. So point being, I don't buy the, the teams that are the Stooges. But it doesn't matter anyway, because in this match, the pattern starts establishing itself. The bell rings start the match, and in under two minutes, they do a spot. (laughs) Brown is face-to-face with Gunther on the floor, and Kaiser dives off the over the ropes, but Brown catches him, and then... Vinci runs up the buckle and bobbles on the top and dives off like he's going to fucking double cross body him now, but he flips and goes right over Brown's back and crashed and burned on the floor and the other two fell down. And again, that was the break spot in 90 seconds after the match started. So you're just starting to say, ah, ah, commercial. But then they came back and again, just they did shit and they went through another break and they came back. And finally, Brown powerbombed Kaiser and tagged Ricochet, and Ricochet got up on Brown's shoulders, and instead of a splash, off the jump off the giant's shoulders with a splash. You've seen them 
They did it with Andre and have done Snooker it with Andre, the yeah. Giants, right? But instead of a splash, which would have been perfect, he just he tried to do a forward flip and do a senton. But you can't push off to do any kind of form because I don't care how strong the guy is. If you push off, it's going to throw everybody's balance off. So he just kind of rolled forward and landed with his full weight right in the middle of Kaiser's fucking midsection. And if you slow-mo it, you can see the guy's face go, oh, fuck, what's happened to me? Oh, my my guts, my ovaries. Uh, One, two, three. I bet you if that hadn't been the finish, the guy said, fuck it, pin me. That right there was the greatest video for anyone who ever hears, that would never work in a real fight. That could never hurt someone. That killed that guy. <laughs> he gave yeah. him a shoot sent off. Yes. <laughs> now, the question in the real fight of whether the guy would lay there for it is, is yeah. up for grabs. But if you, if you stunned a motherfucker long enough, he didn't know it was coming. But so now we're 27 minutes into the show, and that's what we've seen, is that tag team match, and, you know, the the main event stars pull up in the the back in the parking lot. I want to ask you a couple things. Yes, sir. Do you have a problem with the Ricochet Braun Strowman tag team? Do you think this is maybe a good way of using Braun Strowman? Actually, it is. It's a good way of using both of them, because... Ricochet, let's face he's a very talented athlete, as we've said. And every once in a while, when he worked with Gunther, he had a great fucking match. He just can't call him for himself because he's going to just do shit, right? So if you use him as the little underdog babyface partner that can do all the athletic shit and everything, but then the big guys can beat the piss out of him, And then he can fight for the tag to the giant that's bigger than everybody. And you limit strongman's in ring as much as possible to basically comebacks and then throwing his little partner around like a sack of wheat. Then that's actually a pretty decent way to use them. So I'm not, uh, you know, upset or offended that they're a tag team or that they had this match. It shouldn't have gone 25 fucking minutes. And, you know, and, and again, Kaiser and Vinci. They're good workers, but since they're the Stooges, like the Usos, it diminishes the tag team division. And that's not to say the Usos couldn't be, you know, not Stooges, but not while they're Stooges. See what I'm saying here? I want to return to that in a second, but I actually thought this was a pretty good match. And I understand what you're saying, how you're supposed to take a match seriously if it's just the flunkies of people. But I thought it was a good match. I liked it. Yeah. No, they're, they're, they're good workers. With the Usos, I mean, this will be a topic we return to, I'm sure. Based on things we saw a few years ago, and based on the way things have been building up for the last several months and the way things just played out and here at the beginning of SmackDown, with all the focus on Sammy, as it should be, we really don't talk too much about Jey Uso. Based on everything you see from him, should he be a tag team wrestler or just should there be something more to be done with him? Well, <sighs> he shows so much fire in the non-wrestling segments, in the promos, in the ring. You believe him. You believe he's emotionally torn when he's acting like that. <laughs> there has to be something more to be done with him, I think. Well, the there's no you can do more with him and his brother as a team if they weren't if this w- had been pigeonholed more as an elite, to use that word in the proper term rather than the nickname that has been perpetrated by less than elite people, the you know the the whole idea of the four horsemen or the whole idea of when it was Flair and Orton and Batista and Triple H or the if you've got four top guys of a singles champion, a tag team, and an enforcer. If they're all on somewhat of the same level, while still at the same time, the singles guy is, everybody knew Flair was ahead of Tully. Flair was ahead of Arn. Flair was ahead of Luger when he was in the group. Flair was ahead of Wyndham because it was Flair, but they were so close. They were all main event guys. And, and you know, that, but when you have the, constantly have the, opponent for the singles heel in the group 
singly by himself, manhandling and disposing of without too much trouble the tag, the top tag team, it diminishes them, and it's been done over and over. And another problem with Jay, yes, with brothers, Dorian Terry Funk, Mark and Jay Briscoe, Jack and Jerry Briscoe, I could go on. You can always do something different with each brother, but when the Usos are not only so identified with each other, but they're goddamn twins. You got a guy that looks just like the other fucking guy. Well, they look a little different now just because, I mean, as minor as the hair, the hair is a big difference. Well, I mean, you know, you can change the color of the hair, whatever, but they look so similar. It's not, you know, it's not even Mark and Jay look, uh, Briscoe look complimentary to each other, but they still, you could tell them apart easily. Um, Would you do Jay? Their own personalities. Would you do Jay Uso and Sami Zayn against Jimmy Uso and Solo Sokoa? But then one of the Usos is, is unless they go away for a while, one of the Usos is doomed because once you have the brothers fighting the brothers on a regular basis on, on not just one match where something happened and then they fucking realized by the end of it, oh my God, we're still blood or whatever. You have them just wrestling, it, turn on each other and wrestling each other, then that's hard to just, oh, wait a minute, three weeks later. Golly, we what are we doing? Let's not do that anymore. Uh, you know, it, it, again, that's that's probably a match Tony Khan would book because for instant gratification, <laughs> for, you know, Markish thinking, but wh where's the guy in a year from now if you break him up and one's a baby face and one's a heel and that's a super-duper Janetti Michaels syndrome. I guess the question came back to what you said earlier was just the way that the Usos have been used and where they are right now and you see them as just flunkies. Is there a way to get them past that or is that is that done? Well, yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're not flunkies to the level of poor Marcel and Marceau in Imperium because they haven't even had a chance to get established they just they're window dressing and the the marchers behind colonel clink you know i love gunther i'm I just i kid but no the usos have had big matches and they've been on top and they've been in this bloodline thing i mean they're not you know preliminary talent it's just that they still in the picture that they're in in the top group they are the stooges so they're still in the top group and they've been the tag team champions blah, blah, but it could be so much more prominent if they weren't portrayed and, and Roman can still tell them what to do. I'm not saying that they've just physically and as a, a supposed top main event guys that would be befitting the tag team champions, they always get the shit kicked out of them by one guy. It was a steam the other week. Kevin Owens beat up two actual legitimate Samoans. Are we stretching fucking credit credibility to the snapping point that's what i'm saying anyway could we continue with this program yeah i'm trying to talk about the interesting parts well we'll we'll try to get there eventually um well you're a big nascar fan right oh come on yeah so well, we just talked about this on the show it was almost like they yeah. did this for us <laughs> Ray Mysterio and New Day are at the L.A. Coliseum with some NASCAR drivers, and I guess one's a heel and one's a babyface, and they're arguing with each other, too, because they're all doing shtick. The Judgment Day come in to this, I guess, alleged press appearance where there's really no press there. They're just hanging out on the track. And they each pick their favorite driver, and Dominic challenged Ray to a race where the driver was driving, but Dominic and Ray were in there, I guess, right? Is a... And then they get pep talks, and then they raced, and they knocked each other, and they gave subtitles, because with the roar of the engine, you couldn't hear what they were saying. And Ray Mysterio apparently won the race, and I wrote, I hope they got paid for this. Uh, it was a promotional appearance that they were doing something for somebody, and for Fox. I guess we're going to see this at Fox. Yeah. We're going to see this more and more now. I understand they've got a fucking Rice Krispies sponsorship coming up or something. Oh, no, what was it? The Cinnamon Toast Crunch match. The cinnamon Toast. Well, they didn't say they're going to have a Cinnamon <laughs> Toast Crunch match yet. 
Is it the the fucks the fucks the folks the fucks or the fucks those fucks and the cinnamon fucking toast folks <laughs> over at Cinnamon Toast Crunch are going to get a chance to piss in our post toasties with uh, another bad wrestling match. Do you remember the movie Crazy People with Dudley Moore? He's an ad guy. They think he's gone mad. They sent him to a mental institution. And him and all the other patients start coming up with ad campaigns. That yes, take off. yes, that take yes. I I haven't seen that in forty years or whatever. What was it? I think freak. This movie won't just scare you; it will fuck you up for life. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one I remember is BMW from men who want hand jobs while they're driving. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, the cinnamon toast crunch match coming soon to a WrestleMania near you. Well, speaking of coming to WrestleMania. <laughs> we were 47 minutes into the program when the bell rang to start the second match which was for the wwe women's title charlotte flair versus cruella deville and cruella is growing on me because she looks great and she can cut the promo and she's in here with charlotte so it's one of her better matches can i stop you yes I have brought up previously, and I'm a big fan of Charlotte. I think she's great. That I didn't know how it would work her as a baby face between now and Mania. Boy, they gave her the Ronda Rousey speech. Go out there and smile. <laughs> Just smile and smile and smile and smile. That's all she did. It was like night and day compared to every version of Charlotte we've ever seen before. Smile though your heart is breaking. Now, she was in Greenville, South Carolina, by gum. It's flair country. She was happy to be the people. The people obviously were happy she was there. So she was she was in a, a joyous mood. And also, again, that's one of the reasons why I like old Cruella's looks so, so much, because she looks like such a bitch that if she smiled, her fucking face would crack. But I watched this match because it was a single one-on-one -on -one match between two women with some size and great looks and both of them promo better than most of the women and many of the men. And uh, there was more wrestling in the first minute of this match than normal in AEW men's matches. They actually, had, But then they went two minutes <laughs> and went to the fucking break. You cannot get invested in the matches on the, the the interviews can go 20 minutes and they'll just act like they got all the time in the world and the entrances can drone on forever but as soon as they start some fucking wrestling we got to take a break but when they came back a uh, cruella was getting heat on charlotte she was working like a heel you can tell the the performance center does worlds for the women i don't know why it can't do anything for the men Charlotte fairly quickly made a, a big comeback and got a two count with a big boot. And then Cruella stopped her again and they went back and forth. And then the only, they had it going until right till the end. I thought, boy, this has really been good. And this wasn't bad because nobody probably noticed, but when they did the deal where Cruella trips, Charlotte goes for a figure four and then Charlotte's going to small package her. But when Cruella tripped her and went for the figure four, she went the wrong way on the wrong leg. And Charlotte had a small package her to the right, not to the left. And Cruella almost kicked out too late because the referee also couldn't see the shoulders from that way because it was all backwards. But anyway, a couple more false finishes and Charlotte rolled through into the figure eight and got the tap out. And because she's going to WrestleMania... But it was a nice little showcase for Cruella, and it was a good match, and they looked like athletes, and the shit they did made sense. So, <laughs> ah, it's, it's come to this, that in the entire first hour of a network television program, the only thing really worth attention is the girls' match. What did you think? I thought it was all right. Do you think it hurts Sonya Deville, the fact that she was used for so long as a general manager, as a non-wrestling figure mostly? That all of a sudden now she's seemingly a competitor on the active roster. I, I still kind of see her as, uh, you know, and again, I know she was a wrestler and then she left for a while. She came back and she did the GM stuff and everything, but I don't know. It's hard to take her 
I have to see how she's gonna if she's gonna be in the division for a while. It's hard to take her seriously as a wrestler because I don't know if she's just gonna go back to doing another skit. Well, she got a lot more TV time being the co GM than than she would have if she was just wrestling. But I don't know. It's not about honest, how much time. It's about how you take the person when you when you're watching them. I well, mean, yeah, it's like watching Dangerous Danny Davis wrestle a match. But that that's what I'm saying is you know she got a lot more time than she would have. But I don't know. I can't. Remember if we were even paying close attention to the program to understand why she was made the co-general manager. If, it, you know, if they plainly illustrated she had been a top wrestler, but she had been injured. I know she took time off for real because she was stalked and somebody broke in her house or whatever. But if they had told some story like she's, She's a top wrestler, but she either is injured and can't compete or she has been moved into this position for some reason, but they should have reinforced that she can take care of herself, blah, blah, blah. I think if they if they either didn't do that for that length of time and or people just have forgotten that she was a wrestler, that it might have, you know, yeah, they might have should have done something to get her back over in the ring as a wrestler before they start beating her like a drum. But that's just me. And this having is, said, and that, this is just SmackDown and this is just SmackDown. So real quick at the 9 PM hour, who do they have the confidence in the Cody package? That's what we saw. And straight into the bloodline locker room where Roman said, where's Jay? And nobody's heard from you. Jimmy ain't heard from Jay. Nobody can, can't get him on the phone. And Roman's not happy. It's disrespectful. And Jimmy's still saying that Jay's going to be there next week for, for us, or for me, right? He'll be there for me. And Roman's not for us. And he sends them all out to find Jay or get in touch with Jay. And then it was a good time to take a nap. Because here came... <laughs> The brawling brutes of Holland and Butch against the Viking Raiders. And the bell rang, and they went two minutes and went to the break. Hey, you know what? This is one of those areas Vince McMahon was right. Butch was better dressing like some kind of street kid in London 100 years ago than dressing like whatever kind of sea monster the Pete Dunne character is supposed to be. I don't know what's going on here with it, and... And again, Valhalla with the horns and the. Do you, remember, do you remember Dennis? Car <laughs> I always think about it. Dennis Carluzzo's idea for the woman with the horns. No, what? Dennis Carluzzo was using Gino Caruso for a while as the great Caruso. I remember that. Where he was an opera singer. He'd come out with the fucking nose and everything. And Dennis wanted to do something. He never did. He wanted to do it in Yardville. I remember where he wanted to do it. Where. After several matches, the fans, whoever was regularly attending these shows, would be used to by this point. When Gino Caruso, the great Caruso, would win his matches, he would keep beating his opponent, and he'd get on the mic and say, it's not over until the fat lady sings. <laughs> and then he would keep beating him, and they'd get rid of him. And then eventually, at Yardville, Dennis's idea was he was going to get a fat lady with a helmet with horns <laughs> and just go, it's over! <laughs> And it never happened, but it was the best idea ever. Oh. <laughs> do, you, do you think if we were to come out of one of these matches and just sing, it's over, that they'd quit? I'll, I'll uh, chant it throughout the whole show if that <laughs> makes it happen. Well, they, they came back from the break on this one and went another two minutes, and the Vikings won, so that was a four-minute match. But they left both of Holland and Butch laying and went to the back, but then here comes Seamus and Drew, and they attacked the Vikings, and if you did, well, this is where you went sleep, right, on the live broadcast. Yeah, I missed this part of the show, yeah. Okay, Seamus and Drew run to attack the Vikings on the slick floor. They've got the, the floor that has the screen and the colors and everything. It's slick, and Seamus runs at the Baldwin, and right before he gets to him, his feet flat from under him, and he does a baseball slap right, up, <laughs> right between the Vikings' legs and takes him down with, like, it looked like some kind of fucking shoot takedown that he invented on the... 
So anyway, they have a big fight and run the Vikings off. And then we had a recap of the Piss Black match. And then, remember I said I watched Charlotte and Cruella because it was two women having a one-on-one -on -one match and they both look like stars and they can talk and they can work. Okay, who are you well, gonna who are you gonna put down now? Well, they they then followed everything up with a four way for a, the women's elimination chamber. When they do this elimination chamber, and we by the way been forgetting about that that that's in between now and WrestleMania. We haven't even been talking about it, and now it makes sense with what's going to happen here in a little while. But <laughs> they're going to have a women's elimination chamber match on the goddamn show also again can you uh, god damn it can you imagine if on july 4th 1987 in the omni in atlanta if dusty Rhodes had been announcing and promoting for six fucking weeks on television that they were going to have for the first time ever they're building a dome of steel in atlanta a cage to hold the war games. And the four or five top baby faces in the company were going to take on the four top heels in the company and their evil manager in the most bloody, violent, chaotic, dangerous match ever seen in wrestling to settle a blood feud. And by the way, Third match on the card, women's war games. The fuck you, god damn it. All right. So anyway, it's a four-way to eliminate people to determine who gets one of the spots in the elimination chamber between <laughs> Shotzi and Shayna and Natalia and Zelina. You know, I saw some of the bumps. They really were trying to eliminate each other, I think, in this match. This, Zelina owes everybody Ooh. some trance, I think. Oh, my God. I thought they killed her a couple of times. I was I was on screen searching through this to get done with it, but I still stopped on a couple of things. But nevertheless, it didn't take long because they rang the bell. They went two minutes. They went to a three-minute commercial break. They came back to the match, and everybody did shit for two minutes. And then Natalia tapped out Zelina. So they had a four-way and had one minute of match on the air for each girl in the match. So it was just a soup song of a thing. And then finally, we're ready for our main event. Yes, that's right. That's what I'm telling you. A two-hour network television program. We got a tag team match for a half an hour. We got race car drivers. We got Cruella and Charlotte for, oh golly, about... 12 minutes, I think it was. Maybe, no, maybe just 10. Uh, then we got the Brutes and the Vikings for however the fuck long. We got four minutes of a women's four-way. And the main event on the program is a live interview. And they wonder why nobody's interested in their matches. And sadly, anyway. and sadly, the interview is more interesting in every one of and, their matches. Yes, and the interview was the only thing that was really, if I had had my druthers, that I would have watched on purpose out of this whole program. Nobody can find, again, Jay Uso. Nobody can reach him. They're all getting his voicemail. Roman is upset, and he's pissed off, and he's disrespected. And he's been snapping at the other boys, but now he says he needs solo and he needs jimmy he needs everybody together you guys go to the bus the wise man got the sushi and the steak whatever the fuck yeah what was that i don't know hey, listen the steak the sushi they spent way too much time yeah. talking about the food there. he gave the menu <laughs> yeah you'll love the california rolls boys and don't forget that volcano roll but anyway you go to the bus and eat and wait for me i'm gonna go out to the ring they couldn't come up with, he couldn't even say, look, I want you guys on that bus in front of the goddamn fucking Skype. I want one of you on the phone. I want everybody trying to get a hold of, no, just go eat. So he'll be alone for a little while. But anyway, Roman and Paul enter and they get acknowledged. And Roman says he'd rather talk about Cody, somebody who deserves his attention. 
the winner of the Royal Rumble. And again, Roman Reigns is so good. That was good. Yeah. Just speaking so good. Just everything, the material, the delivery, the inflection, the looks, the tone. And he talks about Sammy. Sammy was greedy. He wanted shit from him like everybody else wants shit from him, from Roman. He gave Sammy the opportunity of a lifetime and he used him. And he's doing a great promo and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, somebody in a hoodie jumps in a ring and fucking tackles Roman and starts wailing on him and it's fucking Sammy. And it gets a huge pop. Holy shit, the people are going fucking crazy. And then as soon as of course, you know, Roman realized what's going on. He starts fighting back and levels Sammy and then gets the chair and composes himself. And this was perfect. This was perfect the way that Roman was selling for Sammy, but he was also selling for the surprise. He was, and, and then he didn't just turn his back on Sammy. He, he was turning to get his composure, something that would have happened if a guy that honestly is not his physical level, still got to drop on him. This is exactly how he seemed he would have reacted. He gets the chair, Roman does, and he draw, he's going to go and smite Sammy, and he draws back, and Sammy comes out of nowhere with a spear and gets a massive pop. Boom! And goddamn Sammy gets the chair and draws it back and swings it, and Roman rolls out of the way. Boom! And Sammy plants it on the ground hard, bent the back of it and Roman rolls out on the floor with the Gaga eyes. Like what the fuck is going on here? And then Sammy does the promo. I never wanted anything from you until now. Now I want your title and a big fucking pop. Holy shit. And then here comes solo and Jimmy. They come in the ring from behind and jump Sammy and they beat him down and put the chair on his head. And Solo's going for the, the big ass face. And Roman stops him and takes a chair off Sammy's head and cuts the promo. And here, this wasn't, I didn't, I didn't have the same problem as I did with the rumble being, they, they were allowed to have unmitigated, you know, allowance to kill this guy for as long as possible and nobody lifted a finger. In this case, it was happening, it was going, it was transpiring, it was moving, it was suddenly evolving. You know, we're getting to the point, and then when Roman stops him and takes the chair off Sammy's head, then they're not killing him, he's just yelling at him. But he fucking cuts the promo on him to the, without a microphone, but to the camera mic. You broke up my family. My right-hand man isn't here because of you. I'm going to break you in front of your family. I want you in Montreal. How the fuck did we overlook, yeah. Brian, <laughs> that the February premium live pay-per-view fucking house show event is in Montreal? This is perfect. We were talking about should Sammy and Roman be at WrestleMania? No. They ain't never going to do that one. But Sammy and Roman in Montreal is fucking perfect. It'll be another goddamn, you know, a Calgary Stampede pay-per-view uh, from July of 97 with the whole Hart family. Yeah, and the place will explode when Owens runs in. Yes, that's it's it's perfect. So... That's the thing is Roman now gives Sammy the match in Montreal for the title. And I'm sure they are realizing, I'm sure they've realized this before they've even pulled the trigger on this. Some way or another, whether it starts before Montreal or whether it happens in Montreal and continues to WrestleMania, Sami Zayn and Cody Rhodes are going to be fucking best friends. They better be. And Sammy better be wholly behind and potentially partly responsible for whatever happens. It, it better happen with Cody winning that title from Roman at WrestleMania or elsewise. They, but if, if Sammy is put into a position where he is allowed to neutralize interference or to foil a dastardly plot or to make a difference at a crucial moment when somebody's trying to cheat Cody and then Cody is able to 
win the thing on his own with no unprovoked uh, fucking assistance, then everybody will be happy. But if they are not friends and Sammy has not blessed and endorsed Cody's path to, to the title in some kind of way, there's going to be a significant portion of these people that are pissed off that it ain't Sammy. What do you think? Again, they have the Elimination Chamber in Montreal, so that'll be, you have to think, a major part of the story going into Mania. You keep talking, I mean, everything you're saying makes sense to me, and you're convincing me that that's exactly, not that I have to be convinced, but that it's the right way to go. But again, Owens has to be in this somehow too, I think. And potentially Jey Uso. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts. You do have to somehow get Cody tied into this. I did, going back to what you said before, I love the way Roman Reigns addressed Cody here. He made it realize, I'm not putting this guy down. I'm not going to say this guy's nothing. Yeah. The exact opposite. You're going to want to see this. It's going to build now for months and months, but this has to happen in the middle of it. I guess you're going to have to get Cody tied into it, I would think, unless they somehow try to keep that completely separate. And how do you do that? And then what's Cody doing for the next few months? Well, uh, Cody, because Cody's set up for Gunther, but not for now, because you don't want to burn that out just quickly before Mania. Right. What do you do with him? <sighs> Cody just needs to come back, look good, and look ahead to the title until after Montreal. And in, in Montreal, could it be that could it be that Owens is taken out by the dastardly heels early in the show so that he cannot support his friend and then cody does but then does that give a backlash from the live crowd who wants to see fatso uh do good stuff instead of the next champion i guess that's part of the issue if you're going to get cody tied into this you may not be able to do that in montreal that may have to happen somewhere else or but it, if it's done right a guy saving the the life of Montreal's favorite son ought to get over in Montreal. W wouldn't you think? The American nightmare is Canadian <laughs> royalty. I think that will work. <laughs> yeah, and old fucking Steen, he was offended one time when I said we're in Toronto. We should have you should come out carrying the Canadian flag, and and uh, Richards can come out carrying the American flag because the title of the show was Border Wars. And you know, oh, that's that's cheesy. Yeah, it, it didn't it didn't work for your boy Bret Hart and his family, did it at all? You fucking fat piece. Of, well, nevertheless, <laughs> Jesus. Um. Well, I just every time I think of, every time I watch him in the ring, I'm I'm amazed that he is as good a worker as he is, despite being a fat, disreputable looking, fucking bliff it. Uh. But every time I think about bliff having it. to interact with him personally, a bliff it. You know what a bliff it is. Bliff, it's 10 pounds of shit in a five-pound bag. <laughs> but um, but having to deal with him in a, in personally, on a personal basis. But anyway, some way or another, Cody and Sammy have to be close or uh, okay with each other, and Sammy's got to bless and endorse Cody's path to the top, or some of the people will riot. But at the same time, and not right now while they're negotiating a TV rights deal, and a potential sale of the company and trying to hotshot everything, are they going to give Sami Zayn a run with the, with the WWE title by beating the guy that they haven't had to do a job in the past two years just because he's hot right now? And, and he could be hot for the rest of his life. Who knows? But he still ain't going to... He ain't going to fucking beat him at WrestleMania or anywhere else. I mean, the strategy of starting the show with a little taste of it, and then building towards the end segment, which will be no wrestling but this promo, it works because it, it's good and people are interested in where it's going, but you could probably fill up the show with better stuff. Yeah, and what's going to happen when, when they don't have Roman and Heyman? Because, you know, Roman is already a, a bit part-time, and let's say in a year or two years or whenever it, it happens. And my God, look at Heyman. What could, must his cholesterol level be at this point? Is he so, on the neck machine? 
He's, he's, well, no, are you kidding? They can't, they'd have to custom make one that size to fit that neck. But the point is, he's not going to be around forever. They don't have a lot of people that can carry interview segments as main event of a program. What's going to happen when they have to go back to giving people a main event of an actual wrestling match and expect them to give a shit about it? Because nobody, why do you care about these matches? They're, the fans, the WWF fans come to see the entrances, see the personalities, maybe what one of the live interviews every once in a while, see a fucking dramatic in ring reading, and then they go get popcorn whenever most of the matches take place, unless it's something they're really interested in. So, and and they've the company has done this to itself. In, in being too much of a glossy, glitzy entertainment spectacular, they have lost complete track of what the fucking steak tastes like versus how far you can smell it and how far you can hear the sizzle. Well, that's SmackDown, and this is your show. And it's over! Thank you, fuck you, bye-bye, everybody!